Good morning. This hearing of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee will come to order. Today, we will consider the National Nuclear Security Administration's plan for modernizing the nuclear weapons complex, what the NNSA calls its plan for complex transformation. I want to welcome our first panel of distinguished witnesses, starting with the administrator of the NNSA, Under Secretary Tom D'Agostino. It is a pleasure to have you back before the subcommittee, Under Secretary, uh, and thank you very much for all the cooperation and all the great work you and the thousands of people that you represent do every day for the American people. Following the administrator's testimony, we will be joined at the witness table by the team of experts that manage and operate the NNSA nuclear weapons complex, whom I will introduce at that time. This topic has not received the attention it deserves. The maintenance and modernization of the nuclear weapons complex is a prerequisite to the continuing success of the science-based stockpile stewardship program. For more than a decade, the stockpile stewardship program has enabled us to successfully maintain the safety, security, and reliability of our nation's nuclear deterrent without underground nuclear tests. The nation's success in this endeavor is a marvelous story, and frankly, it is not well enough publicized. But even where there is recognition of the effectiveness of the stewardship program, there is not always a recognition of the challenges of extending that success. With today's hearing, I want to have a frank discussion of what it takes in terms of both fiscal, physical, and human capital to sustain and extend the sense, the success of the stewardship program. The backdrop for this discussion, of course, is the larger debate over the United States nuclear weapons policy. I am as eager as anyone for a 21st century update to our nuclear weapons policies. That's why I led the effort last year to create the Congressional Commission on the Strategic Posture of the United States. I believe the Commission will foster and frame a national discussion on the role of nuclear weapons in assuring our national security. But as the Chairman of the Commission, the former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry has noted, even as we try to move toward a world free of nuclear weapons, we must be realistic about the length of that process. It will take us decades. And so over that time frame, we must ensure that the stockpile stewardship program remains viable, <coughs> which means we cannot simply sit on our hands and watch buildings erected during the Manhattan Project crumble if, they're if in their absence we have no space to do the work that stewardship requires. And it means that we cannot lay off thousands of scientists and engineers and then expect to do the science and technical work that stewardship requires. <coughs> Our responsibilities are greater than that, and that's why we've called this hearing today. With that, let me turn to my very good friend, our ranking member, the distinguished member from Alabama, for any comments we might have. And before I turn to Mr. Everett, uh, we don't have many other hearings planned for the rest of this year. Uh, we expect that we may be out in <coughs> September. Uh, I'm going to begin my process of saying goodbye to my friend. Mr. Everett is going to be retiring this year. Uh, he has had <coughs> a number of years of distinguished service on this committee. He chaired this subcommittee. Uh, the little I know about being a chairman, I've learned from Mr. Everett. He is a great American and a great Alabaman, and uh, I now yield time to the ranking member. Well, I don't know quite how to follow that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, my good, good friend and, and, and chairman's uh, comments. And I'll, what I can say is uh, he's one of the brightest people I've ever worked with, and uh, I appreciate her dedication to, to the issues that we face with, on this subcommittee, which are often, uh, frankly, uh, complex and sometimes controversial, but often controversial. And, uh, you know, we're handling uh, missile defense, all the overhead uh, satellites and so forth, and, uh, and then nuclear weapons. So I very much appreciate the... Uh, partnership that we've had over the years in, uh, in taking a look at these critical issues that for the uh, nation's defense. So thank you very much. Uh, um, You're welcome, Mr. Everett. Chair. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our witnesses. We have some exceptional brand trust with us today. I thank you for all your service and your dedication to what you do. We start down this path, we started down this path in April of 2006 when this subcommittee held a hearing on the department's future plans for the nuclear 
complex uh, weapons complex. I think revisiting this topic, topic is essential, and I thank the chairman for calling this uh, meeting, which is critical and important and timely. I echo many of the concerns that she had. Our nuclear weapons complex is aging, and our nation's cadre of uh, nuclear experts is aging. Without modernizing the infrastructure and fostering a new generation of nuclear experts, we put at risk a key uh, a portion of our nation's defense, our strategic nuclear deterrent. Two years ago, this subcommittee was concerned that despite numerous studies, there had been little change and almost no actual transformation. Since then, NNSA has put forward a plan for complex uh, transformation. Its vision is to achieve a smaller, safety, safer, less expensive complex. Makes a lot of sense. However, there are a lot of questions about particu the uh, particular course of action put forward by uh, NNSA. And many are trying to understand how complex <coughs> transformation relates to other nuclear policies and program issues being debated in Congress. Let me put forward some of the questions now and ask you to address them in your testimony. If uh, you don't have time, then we'll get to them in the question and answer. <coughs> Starting up with, what facility and infrastructure projects should move forward regardless of the future decisions on policy and size of the composition of the stockpile? How does the plan ensure long-term help for the stockpile stewardship program? How does the plan rebuild human capital, as the chairman mentioned, across the nuclear enterprise and manufacturing design, a science, etc. How does the plan meet the military's need for a more responsive infrastructure and its need for weapons that are more reliable, safe, and secure? How would RRW benefit the complex and would it affect our transformation plan? How does NNSA fund transformation with a relatively flat budget? Lastly, for our second panel in particular, is there a better fitness model? What questions aren't we asking that we should be asking? And Congress has before it some challenging nuclear policy and program issues that we uh, do have, uh, uh, have many implications for the complex. I am hopeful that the uh, Strategic Commission, uh, that the, the chairman led the way in establishing uh, last year would help to uh, inform our decision making making on these uh, issues. However, I believe our nation will continue to maintain a strong nuclear deterrent, particularly as long as others maintain or seek nuclear capability. And our allies rely on our extended nuclear deterrent. A strong deterrent requires a strong infrastructure and workforce. And I fear without moving forward on modernization now, we risk weakening the stockpile we have been that we have and jeopardizing our options for the future again thank you all for uh, being here and uh, I thank the chairman for calling this meeting at this time and for her leadership in uh, the commission thank you thank you mr everett under secretary d'agostino the floor is yours uh, as we have received your prepared statement in advance it will be entered into the record uh, i want to thank you again for delivering, uh, once again, a very comprehensive review of the accomplishments and the challenges facing the complex. We welcome your remarks, and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, rank and Chairman Tauscher, Ranking Member Everett, members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss U.S. nuclear weapons policies and our programs. I'd also like to take a brief moment as well to thank uh, Ranking Member Everett for his great leadership on NSA issues. I understand this is in all likelihood your last testimony or last hearing as members of this important committee. And I want to thank you on behalf of the NNSA and all of us uh, out in the field for everything you've done for us and for the nation as a whole. We really appreciate your, your support. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, representatives that you ha we have assembled b behind me. These are the folks that work on our programs and our stockpile and our deterrent, not only that, on nonproliferation and counterterrorism issues. They spend their days and sometimes evenings and weekends working on these programs, worrying about them, and I appreciate your opportunity, uh, the opportunity to have them come forward to show 
talk to you about what they know. My written testimony, as you mentioned, goes into considerable detail on our vision to shift from a 21st century or from a Cold War era nuclear weapons complex to a 21st century national security enterprise. Both of those sets of words are different and mean they're on purpose that they're different. But what I want to convey today is that this vision of a smaller, safer, but modern nuclear security enterprise is well thought out and is first based on requirements that we've received from the Department of Defense. Second, based on our ability to retain the human capital that is unique and world class in performing their mission. And third, there's an urgency to act now to sustain key infrastructure capabilities necessary to maintain our deterrent. As we discuss these issues today, we must remember that the transformation of the stockpile and enterprise is in some effect already taking place. The first chart we have here before us shows the significant reductions in deployed strategic nuclear warheads that have occurred and is planned for the future. As you know, the Moscow Treaty and President Bush's unilateral cuts to the nuclear weapons overall stockpile, which is now half of what it was when he took office, we really don't have a cold, large Cold War weapons stockpile anymore. And since we don't have a large Cold War arsenal, we don't need the large Cold War complex that supported that arsenal and was so important to our nation's security over the many decades in the past. And we have plans to reduce both the square footage of the complex to be more efficient and to focus on the capabilities needed to support future national security needs. A question has been raised by some individual individuals that this administration has not articulated an underlying strategy for our strategic posture. And in response to that, uh, in March of 2008, just this year, Secretaries Bodman and Gates provided Congress a detailed classified white paper entitled National Security and Nuclear Weapons in the 21st Century. The document describes what type of deterrent strategy is needed, articulates the size and nature of the stockpile to correspond to that strategy, and three, articulates the type of infrastructure needed to support that stockpile into the future. As you know, we are the only declared nuclear state that is not, in fact, currently modernizing its infrastructure. Over the past three years, we have been aggressive in our efforts to analyze, describe, and perform environmental studies associated with the type of security enterprises needed to meet future requirements. As you can see from the stack of papers here, uh, this isn't an approach we've taken idly. This is not a PowerPoint analysis. This is detailed business case analyses. Environmental analyses is required. And uh, the team spent a couple of years actually pulling all of this together. And it's remarkably uh, detailed and thorough. And I'm very proud of actually the work that they've done on each of these potential options. Uh, the draft complex uh, transformation supplemental programmatic environmental impact statement was published and posted in January of this year for public comment. And we are systematically in the process of considering over well, well over 100,000 oral and written comments on the documents. And those are the bottom two documents I have here. My intention ultimately is to make a decision in 2008 on this three-year effort in order to continue on a viable path that will support <coughs> the next administration and the recommendations of the Congressional Commission on Strategic Posture, whose origin is from this very subcommittee. And I think the idea is to mesh the, the record of decision with the recommendations so that the Commission has the opportunities and I would call the space in order to make the recommendations appropriate to Congress in the next administration. I think actually the synergy is quite nice here. As members of Congress can appreciate, change can be unsettling and the recent budget dr driven dislocations and involuntary separations that have impacted this program have been very hard on employee morale and the retention of younger staff members. When I announced the release of the Complex Transformation Pro Supplemental Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, I highlighted that scientific and engineering expertise are essential for the 21st century mission of our deterrent and nonproliferation missions. In addition, Secretary of Energy Bodman signed out a lab vision paper most recently, setting forth the strategic mission of NNSA's three national security laboratories and the Nevada test site to be able to respond to evolving 21st century global security threats. Enabled by our core weapons-related programs, these same individuals can and are using their skills in area, other areas of national security importance, such as nonproliferation programs, research and development, nuclear counterterrorism, and support to the intelligence community. Simply put, it is that understanding of nuclear materials and properties, 
weapons and their effects that supports these other critical national security needs out into the future. Regarding the physical transformation of our impl important plutonium and highly enriched uranium capabilities, we need to make decisions and investments today in order for the sustainment of the strategic deterrent out into the future. Key construction projects such as the uranium processing facility at Y-12 and the chemistry and metallurgy research replacement project at Los Alamos are critical to sustain the uranium and plutonium capability that is necessary for any stockpile configuration and to continue nonproliferation and nuclear counterterrorism activities. Outside independent entities such as the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board have noted that it is critical that the NNSA move quickly to replace uranium processing facilities located at Y-12 and the current chemistry and metallurgy research facility at Los Alamos. Over the last three years alone, NNSA has received about a dozen letters from the Defense Board citing concerns uh, with the outdated Cold War era uranium and plutonium operations. The Board, as you know, is uniquely qualified to provide sound, independent, technical judgment with respect to safety and operations. And let me highlight one example. The Defense Board wrote just this year in May that they are, quote, concerned about the NNSA's ability to ensure safe operations of the CMR facility at Los Alamos, <coughs> which may be essential to fulfilling NNSA's national nuclear security mission. Given the facility's age and seismic fragility, some upgrades may be cost prohibitive or impractical, unquote. With respect to the relationship between the new facilities and the size of our stockpile, our investments in these projects are both sound and based on analysis of current and likely future scenarios. The reality is neither our workforce numbers nor facility square footage scale linearly with the size of the stockpile. In today's era of small stockpiles, the required square footage in a modern, well-designed facility to provide essential capabilities frequently provides just the sufficient minimum cap capacity for our work. So just being able to maintain a capability is usually enough for the capacity that's required. This may be best shown on this second chart, uh, labeled Future Uranium Facility Requirements. And I'll walk us through the chart if it could. The Uranium Processing Facility is a facility that we're currently designing. We're not building it right now. We're going to wait. We have to wait for appropriate authorization, of course, uh, to function within various production ranges, which are directly tied to likely future scenarios. And we've considered scenarios from zero up to about 150 units per year as a, as a range or so. Our baseline, there's a title here labeled baseline, it's the second one from the left, is at the 50 to 80 level, consistent with the white paper, classified white paper that, that has been up here since uh, March. So in, a, in the end, this uranium processing facility will replace a series, not just one, but a whole series of 50-year-old buildings, Cold War era buildings down in Tennessee. It's being filled, as I said, to meet the modest requirements consistent with the white paper, 50 to 80, not a, not a uh, MPF-like number, which could be considerably higher. And these are secondaries. These are the components. It's actually the production piece. The bottom bar, which as you can see is almost two-thirds, or particularly on the column on the left, is that blue shaded area just represents the minimum space required just to satisfy, not produce anything just to take care of our deterrent, do the surveillance work that's needed, in fact, also to do work for naval reactors, the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, to do the nonproliferation work, because as you know, we, we're down blending a lot of highly enriched uranium, and, uh, do, and also do work for others in isotope production for scientific activities. So whether we build, to take the, the capacity required to build one more, one secondary, this is the production part, is that per first yellow bar on, on the left there. So you see, just to make one secondary requires an increment of space. So whether you build one or 50, 50 to 80, it's a very small variance in range. And in the end, what it shows is that uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that our designs are uh, flexible and such that just the re required capacity to make one requires a certain amount of capability. In the end, this uranium processing facility, just space-wise, will be about half of what the Cold War era space was overall total, which was spread out across, and more importantly, will allow us to consolidate our security areas. Let me just take a minute, if I could, to focus on plutonium. The ability to work on and analyze and produce plutonium pits 
is essential to maintaining a deterrent and cannot be performed outside of the NNSA. Our current research, surveillance, and manufacturing capabilities require and rely on right now on old nuclear facilities. Last year, after a 10-year effort, we were finally able to reconstitute an interim production capability in a 30-year-old facility. But just as important, our current research and analytical building, the Chemistry and Metallurgy Research Facility, that is essential to maintaining the stockpile, dates back to the early 1950s. It's well beyond its economic lifetime <coughs> and is quickly approaching end of safe operations. The question is, is, what will happen if we do not transform and just maintain the status quo? I think the short answer is, is that we'll reach a point where the NNSA will be unable to maintain our deterrent, not produce anything, we're not even getting to that point of producing, just unable to maintain the deterrent because of the work that we have to do with the surveillance activities. Every year that costs to maintain and secure and operate our fac facilities and infrastructures continues to rise. Yet our program to sustain our infrastructure, to support a reduced stockpile, is cut through the appropriations process. An independent group of scientists that advises the government, the Jasons, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, and the Defense Science Board have all issued reports or findings over the past several years highlighting the need for NNSA infrastructure improvements and modernizations. The last two charts uh, that you'll see, and we'll show the first one will be the Y-12 before and after chart, and then the second one that will follow will be a, a future capability charts, kind of give you an idea of our overall approach. At Y-12, we're going to consolidate all the highly enriched uranium functions uh, into two buildings and take it from the 80 plus acres that we have right now into about 15 acres. So the, the image on the left shows the current image, and it may be hard to see from the uh, rostrum, and I apologize. The image on the right shows how a Y-12 of the future could look. You'll notice a lot more green space because we're going to be actually shrinking that security footprint down by close to 90 percent. That will save a lot of money and it will drive our maintenance costs down and it will make the operations of the Y-12 facility a lot more efficient instead of having activity spread out over a much larger area. That core strategy, and if I could get the next chart, is going to be applied across the complex, this idea of consolidating capabilities. Uh, and over the next 10 years, by consolidating capabilities, what we are going to have is uh, special nuclear materials going from seven sites to five sites in the future with, with significantly smaller security footprints, consolidating mission functions across the enterprise since our capacity requirements are no longer at Cold War levels, closing or transferring weapons activities from about 600 buildings or activities, most of those by 2010, and reducing the square footage of facilities to supporting that support weapons only mission functions by more than 9 million square feet. So the idea of going from about 36 million square feet to 25 million square feet or so of space. And ultimately in the end as administrator, I'm responsible for sustaining our capabilities to support the commitment to maintaining the lowest number of nuclear weapons consistent with our security requirements. I've taken a long hard look at the weapons complex over many years and where I think it needs to be consistent with our future requirements. The need to change is urgent, as you've described. We must act now to adapt for the future and stop pouring money into an old Cold War weapons complex that is too big and too expensive. Assuming we all agree that for the foreseeable future, the nation has a need for a credible strategic deterrent, then we will need a national security enterprise that is safer for our workers than those used during the Cold War regardless of the configuration of the stockpile. And perhaps more important, our dedicated workforce is the key to transformation and its success. Their expertise constitutes a key element of our nation's security, and we must work to provide them the tools and facilities in order to perform their mission. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Now I'd like to ask the uh, impressive, hardworking team behind you to join you at the witness table, and uh, I'd also like to welcome each of them. Okay. Dr. Michael Anastasio, Director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. Mr. Dennis Hayes, General Manager, Defense Programs, Washington Savannah River Company. Dr. Thomas O. Hunter, President and Laboratories Director, Sandia National Laboratories. Mr. Darrell P. Colehurst, President and General Manager, Babcock and Wilcox Technical Services at Y-12. Mr. J. Greg Meyer, President and General Manager, Babcock and Wilcox Technical Services, Pantex. 
Dr. George H. Miller, Director, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Mr. Vincent, Tr Mr. Vincent Trim, President, Honeywell Federal Manufacturing and Technologies, LLC, which manages and operates the Kansas City plant. And Dr. Stephen Younger, President, National Security Technologies, LLC, which manages the Nevada test site. Thank you each and every one of you for being here and for the many, many people that you represent, all hardworking Americans. Uh, and thank you for working with us on the logistics of this hearing, and we look forward to our discussion with you. I'm going to start with a question for uh, Administrator D'Agostino. Um, I commend you for noting that the importance of maintaining the science and laboratory base of the complex and for announcing the laboratory vision for the future. <coughs> At the same time, there have been literally thousands of laid-off staff from the national labs over the last two years. What specific steps do you plan to take to ensure that the critical human capital <coughs> on which the stockpile stewardship pr uh, program depends is not permanently undermined? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. I, there are a number of critical steps. Uh, the most important one, from my view, is uh, exercising with the real work that we have in place right now. Uh, I think the, uh, there is real work in the complex that, that the folks are doing, and to keep people focused on that work uh, and make sure that they understand that I believe it's important, that the nation believes it's important work. Uh, folks out, at, out in the field, and I can let them speak for themselves, but it's my impression based on talking to a lot of people that they pay attention to what Congress does, they pay attention to what we do here, they read our testimony, they listen in on these, on these testimonies. Uh, and they read the paper. And the thing that worries me the most is the sense that the nation does not care about this capability that's kept it so safe. So s specific except from my standpoint is to reemphasize that this is important. And I appreciate the subcommittee's uh, understanding of, of their responsibilities in this area. Uh, most specifically, you mentioned the secretary uh, putting out the lab vision for the future, uh, which addresses the laboratories and, and the Nevada test site and ultimately really extends to the rest of the, the nuclear security enterprise. But ultimately, that vision is vision's important, and that vision described what I've talked about is making sure that we can go off and uh, support other agencies as possible. But it's not, a vision is nothing unless it's implemented. And so the view, my view is to implement that vision this year, what I can do is engage in what I've called strategic partnership agreements with other federal agencies for commitment of resources over multiple years of time that our directors can plan on arriving and to do critical work for these other agencies. And I hope within the next two months to be able to announce such a partnership, specific partnership that's new and different from the past and that maintains a long-term stability in a particular area. And if that works, we're going to continue to look at other areas where we can do more of that. Um, Let's talk about the life extension programs, because it's been argued that the <coughs> LEPs, um, as they're called, uh, for our nuclear weapons have on occasion exceeded the limits of simply refurbishing them. Um, that is not my understanding, and I would like to clarify uh, this for the record. Uh, do life extension programs add any new ma military capabilities to our nuclear weapons? Uh, Ma'am, our, our life extension programs are focused on curse first of all, extending the life, because components do change, but focused on safety, security, and reliability type functions. Uh, this is not about making a new weapon at all. <coughs> Focus, in many cases, on safety and security. Uh, maybe a good example is the W76, uh, where uh, we, we focused on safety by adding uh, the dual strong link mechanism, because we want to make sure that our weapons, where we can, make them safer than what we've had. Technology has changed over the last 30 years. Uh, with respect to reliability, uh, fuses and our, our fuse has changed a little bit on the W76 because the radar technology has changed dramatically over 30 years. So why not put in a 21st century radar instead of a 1970s or 1980s radar in the system duplicating exactly that it was done? But in the end analysis, what we're talking about is, you know, the exact same warhead. It's got the same mission that it had before, it's got the same yields that it had before to make the to make sure it meets the same uh, military characteristics that the Defense Department had originally set out. It's carried on the same platform. Uh, it's carried on the same delivery vehicle, most likely poten potentially the same targets. I'm sure the target set has changed a little bit. Uh, but in essence, it's the same warhead. 
So this is not about enhancing performance or increasing yield or, or going, making it a hard and deeply buried type of a thing at all. So effectively, life extension programs are what they actually are said to be, life extension programs. They're not meant, they are, they, they are not and do not um, change the performance, change the yield, change the military mission. Uh, nothing in the life extension program um, can be constituted as improving the weapon other than in the sense that you're extending the life of the weapon. That's right. And uh, other than the fact that in some cases, uh, that probably doesn't apply to the W76, but some of our older systems have uh, vacuum tubes in them. Uh, you can't buy those anymore. They don't exist uh, in many cases. You probably have to go on eBay or something like that. We're not going to do that, of course. We're <laughs> going to use modern technology to replace that. There are people so, in the room that are too young to know what vacuum tubes okay. are. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> I'm dating myself, I guess. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Miller, um, Director Miller. Uh, what will the National Ignition Facility contribute to the Stockpile Stewardship Program, and what specific areas of uncertainty regarding nuclear weapons performance uh, will the NIP, NIF help resolve? It's the largest laser in the world, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when we did nuclear testing, there were several major areas um, that we did not have fundamental scientific understanding of. Many of these have been pointed out in a variety of uh, studies and reviews, including the Defense Science Board. Um, let me call these the grand challenges of nuclear weapons uh, <laughs> physics. Uh, NIF is the only facility that allows us, in an experimental sense, without a nuclear weapon, to address all of the phases of a nuclear weapon that occur after the high explosive goes off and it goes into what we call the nuclear phase. So the temperatures and the densities that occur, like occur in the center of the sun, would be achievable in NIF. And so uh, issues of um, boosting, which the Defense Science Board called the largest a challenge in weapons physics, uh, energy balance. Um, there are about four of them that are um, addressable by NIF. They will allow us to validate and understand how to do the simulations accurately so that we will uh, enhance our confidence and move further away from the need to do nuclear testing. Thank you. Um, my final question is for Dr. Anastasio, the director of Los Alamos Lab. If uh, CMRR nuclear facility is not built, what are the consequences to the stockpiled stewardship program and to other national security functions such as nuclear forensics? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the CMR, uh, as uh, Administrator D'Agostino said in his comments, is a capability that we use to uh, for the country to underwrite our stockpile stewardship activities. Uh, the chemistry metallurgical research uh, facility is old. Uh, it came online in 1952. Uh, and uh, the capabilities there are, are essential to carry our admission. Um, one example is uh, in the stockpile stewardship program. Uh, periodically, we bring uh, weapons back from the military, take them apart, and do forensics on the uh, components uh, in that weapon. One of those is we actually take uh, the pits apart and uh, take samples out of the pit, take pieces out, and we use our analytic and metal metallurgical capabilities, our R&D scientific tools uh, in this uh, facility to, uh, to look at that material and see how is it aging, is it changing, uh, can we project and predict its life and uh, the issues that may or may not arise. And so that surveillance activity is actually done in this facility. Um, of course, it also supports other missions besides our stockpile stewardship. We do a lot of work to support uh, nonproliferation activities, uh, counterterrorism activities, uh, nuclear forensics, as you uh, identified, and even uh, uh, NASA space missions uh, are supported by the activities that uh, go on in that building. Uh, so. <coughs> Uh, it's an essential uh, capability that must uh, be maintained somehow, but it's getting so old that it's very difficult, and it sits on an earthquake fault, uh, it's difficult for us to continue uh, to meet the evolving uh, modern standards of safety and security. Uh, uh, so uh, building a replacement facility for it 
uh, uh, is a way to uh, sustain that uh, capability in a practical sense. Uh, and then the last point is, of course, it's part as well of the, of the laboratory's transformation efforts uh, to, uh, to get to a smaller, uh, more secure, a more efficient footprint. And as an example, the new facility will be uh, over 100,000 square feet smaller. Uh, it will be uh, relocated inside a consolidated nuclear uh, area at the laboratory, <coughs> which is much more e easy uh, to, to have a security protection uh, uh, perimeter for. And so, uh, and we'll be accommodating uh, the activity that's going on now at the Lawrence Livermore Lab. So it's a way to make us more safe, more efficient, and more secure at the same time continuing to carry out both our stockpile stewardship mission and to support many of the other national security activities at the lab. Thank you, Dr. Anastasio. I'm happy now to yield to the ranking member of such time as he may consume. Um, after Mr. Everett is finished, we will go to member questions uh, under the five-minute rule, and we would expect that we will have two rounds uh, because we have such a large panel and we want to be able to uh, get as much out of you as we can. So I'm happy to yield to Mr. Everett. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. D'Agostino, you touched on this briefly during your uh, testimony, but uh, what facility and infrastructure projects uh, should move forward regardless of future decisions on policy and size and composition of the uh, top pile. And in you also touched on the why, but also retouch on the why, too. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll kind of answer it in two ways. In, from the large sense, uh, it's important for those projects, uh, all those projects that provide that bare minimum capability that's required to maintain a deterrent should go forward regardless of size. Now, size should be considered, of course, but if, for example, uh, a, to maintain a deterrent, I need to maintain a uh, uh, uranium capability. That doesn't mean I should build multiple uranium capabilities. I don't have at least one good one. If I don't have one good one, I need, I need one good one. So I focus it on, do I, is this a matter of capability or capacity? Uh, and my first priority is to maintain capability, because without capability, I can't maintain our deterrent. The capacity part could come later, whether we need a second one or a third one. So I have to have kind of one of everything. And then I have to have it sized such that it allows for flexibility based on the bipartisan commission, the strategic commission that's reviewing it right now. So I'm, I'm sizing it from, like, from the, I'm going to need one warhead up to where we currently are right now. And it turns out that because in many cases, just having one of something means that you can actually build more than one of something. That's probably where we're going to end up. But specifically, the CMR replacement facility, because our plutonium capability and path forward is not sustainable. At Lawrence Livermore, for example, we have a plutonium capability. It's in, it's in a multi-decade old facility, but it's also being surrounded by a community that's just growing right around it. That is not a plan that is sustainable. It doesn't make sense. It costs a lot of money. So, and as Dr. Anastasio described at CM, up at Los Alamos, we're in an old facility there. So between the two, I only need one, and that's the CMR replacement facility. At Y12, it's about uranium, and I described the idea of getting to fewer, uh, consolidating our uranium capability. And that philosophy can, can be carried forward kind of across, uh, across the nuclear weapons complex. But those are the two main ones right now that I'm very uneasy about because we're not on a good path, uh, and we're on a very expensive path, and also, you know, unless we fully support these functions or these facilities. To uh, what degree would, <coughs> excuse me, to what degree would NNSA's complex transformation plans be altered uh, based on whether it pursues a reliable replacement warhead strategy or continues the uh, life extension program strategy? Uh, it would, if we, if the nation decided it wanted to pursue that strategy, uh, our plans could be altered probably in a, in a couple of main areas. Uh, one is beryllium. Uh, our plans for the future don't include beryllium, uh, you, particularly beryllium metal and, and then the oxides. But the idea of, uh, that's a capability I won't have to maintain. Right now, we don't have a capability to do a significant amount of work with beryllium, uh, and we don't actually want to do that into the future. Uh, so our, 
a reliable replacement approach that considers uh, getting rid of some of these materials may, allows me to not have to worry about beryllium anymore. There is a heavy metal that is produced down and manufactured down at, in Tennessee that we would currently have to maintain. Uh, it's a mile-long production process stream down, at, uh, down there. It's in very old buildings as well. It's not highly enriched uranium. But if we didn't pursue another approach, I would need to maintain that capability and not have to rebuild that. So there, these are these are important, but they're marginal uh, activities. I think, uh, at a bare minimum, what I want to do is make sure that the plans we have in place sustain a capability to provide options for the strategic commission and the next administration, so they can move forward down it down down whatever path the nation ultimately decides it wants to go in the long run. Uh, how does NNSA propose a fun complex transformation given what? many and perhaps most believe to be a flat budget. Okay. There are, there are a number of sp steps. I'll describe a couple of, of key ones, and then I'd, I could probably provide a, more, a longer answer. I don't want to take up too much time. But the key uh, couple of steps that we're already putting in place is material consolidation. Uh, by consolidating material, uh, let's say, for example, the work that we currently have underway at Lawrence Livermore to move plutonium significant quantities of plutonium that require this higher level of security out could save about $30 million a year. Now that's, that's real money. That's significant. That's, those are resources that can be put back into infrastructure. And we're not just doing it at Livermore. In fact, we've completed that job at Sandia. In the past, Sandia required a, a lot much larger security force. And uh, most recently, within the last 12 months, we finished the job of moving those materials out. We have opportunities at the Nevada test site because it's a, a very remote location to do work there that could potentially reduce our security <coughs> costs elsewhere. Right now, the NNSA spends over $800 million in security costs. It's money well spent, but there's a much more efficient way to do that. And there are other mechanisms such as consolidating contracts, looking at uh, uh, doing supply chain management in a different way, which is already underway right now. We've We've demonstrated savings of $5 million a year through this concept called reverse auctions, and we're expecting that to grow significantly uh, this upcoming year. And so these contractors have saved a lot of money by looking at business in a different way and working together more than just focusing on being completely independent of each other. So that's, there's some good, good things there, and uh, I'm confident that we can, we can fund a significant part of this. And it, and we're going to have to balance our, our, our workload. There's no question about it with respect to facilities. Uh, <clears throat> largely, the, um, the savings from base closure emissions have not necessarily materialized. And um, I would, uh, when you give us, I'd ask for a uh, more detailed explanation and the underpinning of why you reached the analysis that you did okay. on this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Everett. Uh, we're about to go to five-minute questioning from members. I'd just like to know for the record that on um, the unfortunate passing of uh, former White House Press Secretary Tony Snow, whose memorial service is now, um, has led some members, obviously, to, to not be here. Um, right. And many of them uh, will submit questions for the record. And, and obviously, we extend to the Snow family our deepest condolences. Uh, we go to Mr. Lopesack of Iowa for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to pass. Madam Chair. Uh, we go to Mr. Wilson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chairwoman, and thank all of you for being here today. I'm particularly happy to see Mr. Hayes. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to, along with Congressman <coughs> Gresham Barrett, to represent the Savannah River site. And I uh, have the background. Uh, I particularly appreciate your service. I was Deputy General Counsel at the Department of Energy uh, several decades ago. <laughs> um, but I uh, appreciate um, your dedication and service for our country. And uh, indeed, the Savannah River site uh, has been located in South Carolina for the last, um, since the early 1950s. And it has had um, a, a terrific record of, um, of service. Uh, it's been so appreciated by the community. There's just strong community support. Um, and indeed, uh, I just want to thank Mr. Hayes for his leadership to continue uh, the strong feelings that the people of South Carolina and Georgia uh, have for the Savannah River site. Uh, Mr. D'Agostino, as we are approaching issues, the 
Senate Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee included $22 million in their bill to expand the ARIES mission to bridge the gap between when MOX and the pit disassembly and conversion facility opens. Does SRS have the ability to help bridge this gap using existing facilities and material currently on or destined for the site? Uh, Mr. Wilson, that's uh, that they do. Uh, in fact, we're evaluating that right now. We're looking at this uh, from a kind of a nu nuclear security enterprise response. Uh, we recognize uh, their, their, their workforce at Savannah River, at the Savannah River site, is dedicated. They, they know what they're doing. They work with plutonium. Uh, and they're part of our solution set as we look to figure out how do we bridge that gap between the startup of the MOX facility and uh, the and uh, the, the you know bridge that gap between the PDCF project and the startup of the facility. And our our important my important view is we need to have the oxide material to keep MOX running because I want to I want to get all of the value out of that facility. We certainly support your goal. Okay. Uh, the NNSA has determined that there is a need to uh, has it determined there's a need to expand the mission of Aries. Uh, that's that's right. In other words, uh, right now our current plan doesn't because we expected there to be not much of a multi-year gap, and the reality is is that because of uh, funding profiles, there has been some shifts as a result of uh, of moving uh, projects back and forth and not full funding that have caused the gap to to widen. So we are going to have to do a little bit more, most likelihood, in uh, in the Aries process. But ultimately, in the end, what we're trying to figure out is what makes sense in the long run. And on funding, uh, is this additional $22 million appropriation for ARIES necessary at this point? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that question, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I think it just came out recently. Uh, what we're trying to do is figure out what's the right thing to do programmatically and then figure out then what are the resources we need and where do we need the resources in order to support the ultimate goal of downblending the 34 metric tons of plutonium. And then, of course, uh, just last year, the Secretary added nine more metric tons of plutonium to the batch, if you will, that's going through. And we're looking at ways to continue to add more material to be downblended. And so uh, I don't know if, uh, if this is the right amount of money. Uh, uh, that's something that we're going to analyze, and that uh, Bob Smolin, who runs uh, defense programs, he's the deputy administrator there. That's, he's got a team of people, includes Savannah River, to look at that. And of great importance to the community, how does an expanded ARIES mission fit into the NNSA's vision for the new weapons complex? Uh, if, well, I think it really kind of depends on whether the uh, expansion of ARIES where it currently exists is the right is the right approach. We haven't made that determination. I think our my goal ultimately is to make sure that uh, uh, I mean right now Aries is is an activity that's being conducted, but we don't think it's it's got that that pace and rate that can actually cover the gap. So in the end, we want a permanent solution because what we've got is the 34 metric tons plus nine metric tons plus potentially another sizable piece, a slice of plutonium that we're going to add to the capability. And those, you know, all of that material, whether it's 50 tons or not or more, will, will be part of the answer, the business case answer that we'll come up with. And uh, in conclusion, under uh, DOE project management order DOE uh, 0413.3a, a full evaluation of the alternative analysis is required before making a decision. Are there plans to initiate a full analysis of alternatives? Uh, absolutely. Uh, right now, the pit disassembly and conversion facility, uh, what we call critical decision two, where we establish our baseline, is scheduled. Uh, it's, it's probably going to happen January time frame or early next year. That 413 order requires us to reevaluate the previous critical decisions, and the previous critical decision is to reexamine all options because it's important before we commit resources that we know that we're on the right path. And so we will do that as part of DOE 413, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Mr. Sir. Wilson. Uh, five minutes to Ms. Hongas of Massachusetts. Thank you, and thank you all for your testimony. Yeah. There's many of you up there, but I'm going to address this question again to Mr. D'Agostino. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> in, the, in the wake of recent Department of Defense nuclear mishaps, 
select independent reviews have highlighted an erosion across the nuclear enterprise. To what extent has this erosion materialized within the nuclear weapons complex, and how do NS NNSA's complex transformation plans address this? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it reflects something that I've, we've been thinking about for the last number of years, actually. Uh, we in this business have been pay close attention to the Defense Department and work closely with them. Uh, about two years ago, the Defense Science Board wrote a report <coughs> which described concerns about the infrastructure and attention on strategic Wait, issues on. such as these. Uh, in that report, there are recommendations for both the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense to undertake. Uh, Secretary Bodman, as part of that, because he was briefed out by uh, General Welch, who headed up that report, and in fact, he talked to the Secretary of Defense at the time, and actually had a meeting with him with the Deputy Secretary, took those actions very seriously and made a number of changes uh, to, the to our organizational structure, and I think drove a tremendous amount of focus on the Department of Energy side. We initiated a program called Getting the Job Done, which focused on 10 specific items to restore the capability to meet Defense Department needs. Uh, there was a bit of reorganization where the side office organizations that had previously reported up in the organization were shifted back down to defense programs. Uh, uh, and in this case, I've got uh, uh, Air Force General retired Bob Smolin in that job. He is tightly connected with the new Air Force leadership and has showed them what we have done and provided recommendations to the Air Force on how to address that. One final point is that as a result, uh, Admiral Kirk Donald is dual-hatted. He reports into the NNSA to me as well as to the Department of Navy. He was the, uh, the admiral that led the investigation for the Secretary Gates uh, and had shared what his lessons learned were as a result of his investigation. And Bob Smolin and I have chartered an independent group led by uh, Bill Desmond, who was the former Chief of Defense Nuclear Security, to make sure and evaluate those lessons learned from the Defense Department. Let's make sure we bring them back here in the, the National Nuclear Security Administration to make sure that we're doing the right thing and that we've covered all our bases. Uh, that, that, that review is underway right now. And uh, expect, I expect to get some feedback. Bob Smolin and I expect to get some feedback uh, this October time frame, roughly, this fall. Because we want to take action if any is needed this year on that, on that, that path forward. Thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. Do you yield back? Uh, Mr. Spratt for five minutes. Mr. Spratt from South Carolina. Well, thank you all for your presence and for your testimony. Is the five site complex that you now have in mind dependent on the RRW? Is it modeled around that particular focal point? Uh, no, sir. It's uh, the consolidation of materials to five sites, I, th is, I think, is maybe what you're referring to, is independent on whether what approach we use for a future stockpile, whether we maintain a life extension strategy or look to add enhanced safety and security via other methods. Um, our view is, is that uh, uh, we need to cons consolidate our material for a couple of reasons. Efficiency right now is, uh, and, and cost savings are, are huge parts of that. And plus there's the safety and security aspect. If the material's in fewer, fewer slow locations, it's easier for us to protect. And it's easier to make sure that that workforce is trained and know how to work on that on a day-to-day -day basis versus trying to spread that capability around to too many sites. Since you speak of capital costs, can you give us an idea of what the likely capital cost is going to be, the incremental cost over and above your typical capital budget? Uh, right now, we spend on the average of our capital budget in the NNSA averages somewhere between $250 million to $450 million per year, depending on the year, because it goes up and down depending on the projects that we have overall. Uh, we expect that this modernization effort is probably going to increase that baseline to about 600 million, 650 million per year. So on the order of 150 to 200 million per year more. So our focus is, is to drive down costs through better business practices, through consolidation of materials across the complex, through 
supply chain management. But, but the incremental cost is 150 to 200 million dollars a year. Uh, roughly, and it, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on uh, there's there's unknowns out there. Uh, one is uh, this critical decision two, where we establish a performance baseline. That's kind of my contract with my contractors, if you will, saying you agree to provide this building at this date for this time for this amount of money on this rate of expenditure. Both the critical decision twos for the two facilities that we're talking about, the UPF and the CMR, we haven't reached those points yet. Uh, the CMR critical decision two won't happen until we do a little bit more preliminary design work until the year 2010. And that's something that the laboratory is working on uh, fairly aggressively. And uh, the UPF uh, is, is a little bit is downstream as well. When we get those critical decision twos, we will have to marry up and make sure that our cash flow is supported by our existing budget. And that will be, that's the work that will have to happen. You, you indicate that you would anticipate removing about 600 buildings and facilities? Uh, what we would do, yes, yeah, some of those buildings and facilities are actually just underutilized and not needed anymore, so we would take them down. Yes, sir. How many of them have contamination costs, cleanup costs associated with them? Uh, I don't have that. I don't have that accurate number on the top of my head. I'd like to take that for the record, if I could. Um, but what there are a number of these facilities, for example, that have very little contamination and are fairly simple to take down. And our FY09 request established a funding line, requested a funding line for called transformation disposition. In other words, dismantling. And these, this is not the heavily contaminated buildings. There is a smaller subset of facilities that we're going to be working with our environmental management organization to see, you know, how we're going to do that. And that work, it, it really depends on the preferred alternative. I have a draft plan that is out in public right now. When we get to the record of decision point, when we have agreement on what we will do, then we're going to sharpen our pencils on those particular points and figure out which ends up on uh, which side of the line and how we want to move forward. Okay, I have a couple more questions, but I'll come back to them. Thank you, Mr. Spratt. I'm happy to go to Mr. Reyes for five minutes. Mr. Reyes of Texas. No, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I, m my questions uh, are along the same lines uh, uh, as Mr. Spratt, Mr. D'Agostino, because the, uh, the consensus is pretty much that we're going to be seeing pretty flat budgets in the, in the foreseeable future, probably the next decade. Right. Uh, so there are, I, I've got, I've got uh, some concerns that go back to when I was the ranking member and Mr. Everett was the, was the chairman Fr from several perspectives. Number one, uh, as as you go through this process of eliminating these buildings that that uh, aren't being used and take into consideration the cleanup and all these other things, for me, security has to be an issue. And so I'm wondering, given the given the budget, uh, given the challenge, and given the transformation, how are you going to uh, be able to re reconcile that or what, what is the plan to be able to provide uh, and maximize security given the challenges we've seen in the, in the recent past? Okay. They'll, they'll be on the security piece of it. Uh, within the security uh, budget, the Defense Nuclear Security Program, there's a line on uh, uh, research and development and technology insertion. In other words, it's the idea of doing security differently, not doing it doing less security, but doing it from a different standpoint. And there are a number of technologies that are being looked at to be implemented, uh, remotely operated weapon systems, for example, uh, that can reduce the overall level of cost, since the cost in security is over $800 million a year. So this is not about less security. This is about doing it a little bit differently, because the biggest cost of security ultimately are the um, costs associated with maintaining a very large workforce. And the more guard stations there are that exist out there, and the more numbers of guards that you have to maintain those and the like. Um, there are some activities that are being considered across the complex. Some of, uh, some of my colleagues may be able to provide some specific examples of security technologies that they've been able to actually implement in their areas. We know that we can save $30 million by 
shifting the Superblock facility at Livermore from a Category 1-2 facility to a Category 3-4 facility. Um, because and that's, that's a pretty significant cost. We know in Texas, for example, at the Pantex plant, we can look at Zone 4, which is a, a remote weapons storage site with plutonium and the like, in that if we move some of that underground, and we've got capabilities across the complex, uh, we can change the security posture dramatically. So right now at Pantex, we protect two very large areas, Zone 4 and Zone 12, for reduced program because we recognize I recognize that you know there is not an, there's not enough room to add if you will a large multi hundred million dollar line on top of everything else it's not affordable so we have to look at doing business differently and that's one that's our third strategy is change the way we do business well, well so, uh, some of the concerns that, that I have and again predicated on the experience uh, that I've had in, in particular in this committee as, uh, as a ranking member uh, is that that we don't cut corners that we don't uh, 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 that, that I guess the because one of the one of the big issues that we identified previously was the the culture of some of these facilities was that you know we're scientists we don't have to worry about security that much that somebody else's uh, it's somebody else's concern. So cutting corners, uh, the challenge that we have with the budget, the uh, uh, understanding that there was a commitment made to this committee or the subcommittee that training on an ongoing basis to make sure that there's the, the workforce is uh, sensitized to security and the, the breaches that we've experienced in the past, that that doesn't fall by the wayside. Right. You know, in in tough budget times, unfortunately, one of the first things that go th that goes is is training, and that's an important part of this piece, given the the track record of some of these facilities. So I hope you keep the the subcommittee informed of uh, uh, of this ongoing, because it sounds like it's an ongoing uh, and and fluid plan that's evolving, so that we can, uh, I guess, make sure that. Those concerns are, are, are addressed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Um, I'm going to go to questions before we go to Mr. Larson. Uh, I'd like to talk, uh, ask a question of Dr. Hunter from Sandia. Um, following the competitions for the contracts to manage and operate Livermore and Los Alamos laboratories in the last few years, some have begun to question whether for profit entities are ideally suited to manage these institutions. Should the business model of governance of the national laboratories be a consideration in, in complex transformation? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, very important question, one that uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about because we, we like to look at, uh, our, for instance, our role at Sandia and ask what's the best way which we can support uh, the government. I'd like to make a, just a couple points about how I feel about that and then directly okay. address your question about for-profits. Um, I think an essential ingredient which can't be bought at any price, but which is, which is critical moving forward is that each of the institutions be an institution committed to national service. That their primary and fundamental role is we are about national service. And all of our decisions and all of our incentives for decisions are about how we serve the nation best. Secondly, it's very important that the incentives and the roles and the leadership of the institutions think about how to have both, not either and not a balance, but both excellence in operations, including security, and excellence in science, a quest to try to maximize and provide both as at the best possible level. And then getting more directly to your question, uh, each institution, uh, each person who leads them, and each person who has a, a re responsible position uh, has to feel accountable for what they do. They have to feel accountable to this uh, value of national service. They have to feel accountable to the fact that they must deliver. And with the accountability and the feeling of accountability must go the, f the, the authority to deal with it. And, and the proper balanced role of what, who does what in the institution and who does what with respect to the federal government. And then lastly, the, uh, a dominant criteria should be the stewardship of its people. And the people, that are, as reflected in earlier comments, have to be felt to be valued and respected and supported. Um, you, cannot, um, you cannot buy, and it's a good thing, you cannot be, buy people who know and care about nuclear weapons. 
Uh, they have to be created, they have to be invested in, they have to be supported. Uh, if you put all those together, uh, I think it does not matter so much about profit or for profit. What matters is what, what is the ethos or the value statement of the institution, how is it supported, and how is it managed, and how does the federal government then respond by acknowledging the accountability and the incentives that go with it. That's a great answer. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Younger of Nevada, Nevada Test Site. Uh, in your testimony, you suggest that the device assembly facility at the Nevada Test Site is underutilized. What additional stockpile stewardship program or national security activities could be supported there? And what sort of modifications, if any, would be required to enable <coughs> such work? And what would they cost? Uh, the device assembly facility is currently being modified to house the critical experiments facility that was formerly located at TA-18 at Los Alamos. That will result in considerable security savings while providing a full capability for the nation. When that modification is complete, we will still have 40,000 square feet of empty space in the device assembly facility at a, at a time when nuclear-capable space costs approximately $65,000 per square, feet, square foot to build. Uh, that could be used for a variety of missions. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of augmenting, uh, not replacing certainly, but augmenting weapons disassembly in the DAF or small lot special case disassemblies. There are a variety of plutonium operations that could be conducted in the DAF business case warrants, uh, including surveillance including an augmentation to the ARIES process at Los Alamos uh, and including other plutonium operations. The typical cost for the modification of the DAF, since it is a fully capable nuclear facility today and since security is already paid for by other missions, and I might add that the DAF is considered one of, if not the most secure facilities in the DOE complex, the cost of modification for a major mission would be between $100 and $300 million, which is considerably less than the construction of the facility. Um, just as an aside, many of our colleagues and I, uh, with, with uh, Administrator D'Agostino, took a tour of many parts of the complex a, a few months ago, and um, I think one of the most fascinating things that the American people don't understand, which is why, why this narrative that we're building is so important, is when you go to the Nevada test site, which I would recommend you change your name, when you go to the Nevada, Nevada test site, it is a, a warren of busyness. There's so much stuff going on there. You've got so many uh, other things that you're doing uh, that are very important, homeland security, national security, so much going on there. And I think that most people think that when you go to the Nevada test site, you're moving away the cobwebs because it hasn't been used for so long. And the truth is, it's a dynamic facility. And um, I think it's, it's very important that we continue to get the message out of all the other work that's being done there. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not kidding about changing the name. I cordially, invite, <laughs> I cordially invite all the members of the committee to visit the, uh, the site that is currently in Nevada that will shortly be renamed. We will, we will be back. Um, and also we went to uh, Pantex and, and we have uh, Jay Greg Meyer here who's uh, from Pantex and, and we just like to talk a little bit about the operations and workload at Pantex and uh, would it be altered um, if, if the decision on the life extension programs was life extension programs only uh, or if we move to uh, something that was similar to the ROW strategy, what kind of um, uh, workload uh, would Pantex have? Would it be altered um, in the mission that you have there at Pantex? The, uh, the exact mission would not change uh, in, in terms of assembly, disassembly, but the, the mix of that workload would. But right now, if uh, we do a number of different weapon systems, both lifetime uh, ex extension programs as well as uh, dismantlements, as well as surveillances, if the decision was made to do only LEPs, we would then focus very heavily on that and continue to do dismantlements and then surveillances as necessary. If uh, we were going to go down the RRW path, on the other hand, we would probably not do LEPs or surveillances to the same extent. Uh, we would be building one new weapon system, RRW, <coughs> but doing very heavily dismantlement work. Uh, bays and cells at Pantex are uh, multifunctional in that sense. Uh, they don't wear out. We, we basically stage the tooling appropriate and do the training so that the workforce would be about the same. Training would be slightly different, especially if it's RRW. Um, with RW, 
uh, since it's a, it would be a new design, actually we're working, uh, we've been invited to, <coughs> excuse me, to participate with the laboratories and, and give some of the actual production input so the design would, uh, would, would have uh, our inputs in and make the assembly disassembly process uh, easier for us. So, but uh, the flexibility of the Pantex site would support either role. Thank you very much. Um, and I've got a question for uh, Vincent Trim of Kansas, Kansas City Plant. Um, the decision was made to build a new facility at Kansas City. Um, talk, talk very briefly, if you can, about how what, what the process of evaluation was to make that decision. Um, assumably, the decision to build the new facility was included cost savings. And if you could just tell us a little bit about why the decision was to build the facility as opposed to consolidation. Certainly. <clears throat> the, uh, the current facility was built in the uh, late 40s and is approximately 3.3 million square feet. We believe the mission only requires roughly 1.2 million square feet of manufacturing space, so it was a pretty easy business case when you look at the cost of maintaining a Cold War structure, uh, security, maintenance, uh, and, and a whole host of costs that go along with that. We had independent uh, groups look at the business case and primarily uh, the driver is that maintaining the capability is also about maintaining the talent that exists. Uh, we're more than just uh, assemblers of nuclear or builders of components. We have engineers and we bridge that gap between design and manufacturability at the Kansas City plant. But the business case is very compelling and will yield $100 million a year in savings. <coughs> Uh, when we hit uh, rate production and get into the new facility in 2012. Thank you. Thank you. I have questions for Mr. Colehurst and for Mr. Hayes, but I'll hold them till after Mr. Um, Larson of Washington asks his questions for five minutes. You want to you pass? Yeah, I'll pass. Uh, Mr. Colehurst? Yes. How are you? Um, the Y-12 plant uh, in Tennessee, um, the plant uranium processing facility uh, is being designed to accommodate potential shifts in uh, our strategic weapons policy, um, <coughs> I assume. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, that is being done and how you're facilitating the kind of flexibility that may be needed? C certainly, uh, Madam Chairman. As, as we have uh, uh, working through the uh, preliminary and concept designs of that facility, we have made sure that uh, the maximum flexibility is there for, for changes in the stockpile, uh, changes in the workload. Uh, the facility is being designed with all the correct safety systems and security systems uh, built into the facility uh, so that if these changes come about, uh, we're prepared to move processing equipment, uh, reconfigure the processing lines, add capability where we need it, reduce it in other areas. Uh, it's a general, it's a very general manufacturing facility on the inside of the processing area, although it has some, uh, some, some, some nuclear safety systems that surround it that keep us safe no matter what we do. So all of those are being taken into consideration as we do the design. Thank you very much. Mr. Hayes, um, what should the uh, NNSA and Congress do to ensure that DOE planning for plutonium disposition at Savannah Riverside uh, what do we do to make sure it's synchronized with the NNSA's complex transformation plans? Good morning. I, I think the activities that Tom talked about before that are currently underway to ensure that the activities going on at Savannah River with a broader perspective of the NNSA are accounted for. We have several key experts at Savannah River with years of plutonium experience participating in complex councils to make sure that that information is, is uh, communicated. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spratt for second round for five you, minutes. You may have answered this before, and I was listening to the testimony and reading the briefing memorandum at the same time, but what is the current plan for the location of the pit disassembly and conversion facility? Is it slated to go to the Savannah River, or will it, uh, is it being considered for a location elsewhere? I'll take that, Mr. Spratt. Uh, our current plans is to build a pit disassembly and conversion facility at Savannah River. Uh, the activity that we have underway this year is to make sure that the MOX facility that we're also building at Savannah River yeah. has the material, the feedstock it needs to keep operating because we don't want to operate it just for a short period of time and then sh have it shut down for a couple of years while it waits for the PDCF to finish construction. So, uh, so that's 
there was a the, this discussion on the Aries line was to ref, to make sure we fill the gap, if you will, or mine the gap, and make sure that that gap gets filled, whether that gap gets filled by uh, modifying modifying some facilities at Savannah River to fill the gap, whether it gets done at Los Alamos to fill the gap or Nevada to fill the gap, that business case is underway. But the program of record and our path forward on PDCF is to build it at Savannah River. The one of, one of the uh, necessary facilities you've indicated would be plutonium production. And I've been through TA55 a couple of times, and each time we've been seen that facility, we've been told it has a production capacity with one shift and a maintenance shift, I think, of about 50 pits a year. Is that not adequate for the uh, stockpile that we're envisioning for the future? Uh, Mr. Spread, that's absolutely right. It's adequate for the stockpile we're envisioning, 50 to 80 pits per year. Uh, what, what sometimes it, and maybe Dr. Anastasia can add on at the end of this, if, to to clarify my statements, uh, since his, the expertise exists at both at Los Alamos and Livermore. Uh, but in order to do what I would call basic surveillance, in other words, take care of our current stockpile, do the analytical chemistry and material characterization work, the TA-55 complex, of which you just described, relies on this other building, which is not located there, to do the chemistry work. And that's that other building that's very old that we're very worried about. But the 50 to 80 pits per year, which is part of our current requirement and in our classified paper, uh, the laboratory believes that with changes, it would require some changes internally, glove boxes and lathes and things like that, uh, that it could happen. Maybe. Yeah, just to, Mr. Spratt, to uh, amplify a little bit, the existing PF4, which is in the TA55 that you've visited in the past, uh, we believe we have adequate space to uh, support all the uh, stockpile stewardship mission uh, that we have, including up to a production c capacity of 50 to 8 pits per year. We will have to do some reconfiguration of the glove box lines and so forth that's inside that building, but it will not, uh, and of course we have to do normal upgrades uh, to maintain that facility over time. Uh, but we believe there's, uh, we're convinced that there's adequate uh, space and capability for that. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to also say the replacement building for C CMR that we're contemplating, which would be co-located there within the same security perimeter, uh, again, will give us the opportunity to uh, get more efficiency for security and more effective. But also, that's not a facility that we will use to do pit production. So we will not be doing pit production in the new facility we're trying to build. Uh, it's just the capability to do the analytic chemistry and the metallurgy that goes along with our surveillance, uh, it's a, uh, uh, and all the other missions that we carry out, uh, we, uh, we believe that that facility is needed regardless of whether we make zero pits per year or 50 to 80 pits per year. Uh, that production role will go on in the existing uh, PF4 that you've seen. One final question, if I may. We've talked all morning about facilities, bricks and mortar, but the real essence of this complex is people sure. and attracting in the next generation the kind of people you've had in prior generations. Do you build that concept into the design of this? Are you looking for missions you can accommodate with your new facilities complex that will be attractive like the NIF uh, at uh, Livermore? Uh, is this part of your planning and how do you attract in the next generation of talent you've been accustomed to? Uh, Mr. Spratt, I'll, I'll start with the federal answer on the federal side, and I may, if, if you permit, ask one of somebody to comment on the contractor side, because there's multiple programs. Uh, on the federal side, uh, in fact, we may even have in the room some of, we have a program called the Future Leaders Program, where every year we go out and recruit uh, from uh, universities and colleges all over the country to bring in top talent in both engineering and business practices, about 30 some odd per class. We're into our fourth class right now. I did the graduation uh, not too long ago. Uh, and it's fantastic to have young folks come in with different ideas on how to, how to work things. These are people that are very smart. Uh, I've asked them to make sure to not rely on the way we currently do business if they've got a question to ask it. And in many cases, uh, one gentleman in particular took a look at how we look at safety data. Uh, 
and because we compile a tremendous amount of data that our, these eight sites pull together. And we've been analyzing it for years in a certain fashion. And this, this, uh, these young folks came in there and says, well, what about looking at it this way? And it's amazing what we learned by that just that one experience. So we are very much energized on the federal side to bring in fresh talent on that standpoint. It's, it's pretty exciting to see actually get, getting folks in like that. And if I may, I could ask uh, some of the other panel members to comment on your question. If that's Briefly. Right. Sure, I, I would Shakers. run down the line. Uh, as an example, uh, some of the new capability that we're in place, uh, like uh, our new Roadrunner computer that's the fastest computer in the world now uh, at Los Alamos, uh, brings in talent because it's, th it's the same capability that you need to use uh, to do any kind of high-performance computing. Uh, it enables us to do uh, our global climate modeling and, and understand uh, much better La Nina, El Nino uh, kinds of weather because of uh, uh, water patterns in the Pacific uh, that we can now analyze with much more uh, resolution. At the same time, just this summer, we have over 1,000 students uh, at Los Alamos. Uh, we average uh, about 350 postdoctoral students uh, per year at the laboratory uh, as our pi pipeline, and uh, it's still a very high quality uh, set of workforce. Uh, so it's these other programs that we do that is the window of the, uh, for the uh, students to want to come to the laboratory uh, and become part of all these uh, other activities. Let me just step back a, s a step. I, I think fundamentally, <clears throat> this is the comment that Tom Hunter made earlier. Fundamentally, people come to the laboratory to serve the nation. They need to know that what they do is valued by the country. Um, they also like the laboratory because uh, we are given a set of scientific and uh, technical challenges on behalf of the country that they find exciting. Um, and it's a stable work environment. Um, all of those things have to do in a very fundamental way with the way Congress and the administration look at the laboratory and make use of the talents of the laboratory. And those underlying issues or overarching issues, if you care to think of them that way, are really as fundamental as the particular programs that we have. Tom, did you want to say something? Thank you, Mayor, if I may just briefly. Uh, this is not a dilemma for these institutions only. This is a dilemma for the nation. And one important and I think uh, essential way to look at these laboratories is we are not a small player in that. We are a large player in where the nation goes on its commitment to science and engineering. And these institutions stand at the very forefront of that today. We have to make sure that continues to be the case in the future. And we, we promise them just two simple things. If they come to these institutions, they can work on the nation's security, and they can also work at the forefront of their scientific fields. We must maintain that as we go forward. Madam Chair, from a, a plant perspective, I think attracting talent is highly dependent on the impression these graduates have on the commitment to the complex, the recapitalization of the complex. And pivotal is the reframing of the mission to encompass a national security uh, mindset. And I think that really resonates with uh, people who want to serve the nation and be part of the mission. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that it is, it is a challenge, that, especially in Amarillo. We've got a geographic challenge that some of the other sites don't have, and, uh, and you, you've been there, Madam Chair, and, and, and others. And uh, it's a relatively modest site, so we recruit very heavily among uh, university students and bring them on as interns and actually uh, re recruit them at that point and, and pay for them their last year as a tuition reimbursement. Um, three or four years later, those people have clearances, they have good experience, and, uh, and they're somewhat tired of the Amarillo social life, and so they're ready to move on to bigger and better things. So <laughs> we do have a retention problem that, uh, again, we, we're, we're keeping up with it, but it's a continual battle. So, uh, but it, we recognize that that's, that's clearly our legacy. That's where we need to focus. Just a quick comment. Uh, Y-12 has just kicked off a new apprentice program. 50 new apprentices, and we have 2,610 applicants. We have a manufacturing academy where we reach out to the high school, work with high school. We have an exchange program with the community college. 
So all of us as plants are looking at that critical skills, making sure we have the pipeline full, making sure we have folks ready to step in as we see our population moving more and more toward the plant. I'll conclude by, by saying that uh, the Nevada test site can help with Amarillo as social program. I was just going to recommend that <laughs> exchange program because what stays in Las Vegas obviously stays in Las Vegas. But seriously, uh, as uh, Dr. Miller said, it is all about mission. And people come to the Nevada test site because they believe they are doing something important for the nation and they are doing <coughs> technically excellent and interesting work. So, so long as there is important mission to be done, I feel confident we will attract the best in the nation. Mr. Hayes, I assume you concur with all that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spratt. Mr. Everett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very interesting conversation. Uh, I know that uh, in many of the fields that we uh, of advanced science and engineering that we have a lot of problems in uh, finding people to go into those fields, young people. And I was wondering uh, a couple of things. Number one, how many of those um, applicants that you have or folks working for you are uh, foreign born and what troubles is, would, uh, does that present in vetting them and also in the overall picture, everybody included, are you having a lot of trouble getting uh, clearances for them? Tom? I'll, I'll start off on that. Uh, on the federal side, uh, we don't we don't have, I think, the same types of a problem. Uh, we, we've been recruiting uh, to make sure we get a diverse uh, workforce coming in uh, at that young age. That's really important to us because it's these different backgrounds that people bring to the table that allow us to look at problems in a different way. And ultimately, solutions really rise out, out of that. Uh, we, we do have a challenge on security clearances. That's ultimately a responsibility of the government to grant those. And uh, it has had, does have an impact. It ends up being a cost impact. I think uh, both the labs and plant uh, directors here could probably give an anecdote to describe the type of impact that it has. But my sense is that uh, uh, we have started trying to be smarter in how we hire to make sure that we do some pre-screening up front so we don't bring people in and then have them sit and do kind of unclassified work for a year while we try to get them a clearance and find out that there was a problem in their background. So a lot of it has to do, and we flushed out a lot of that, particularly in this organization that's a federal organization called Office of Secure Transportation, where we have a number of federal agents. These are government federal agents that protect the material and the warheads as they move around the country. So it's been a challenge. Uh, money fixes it to a certain extent, but we don't want to throw money at, at something if we can fix it from an operational standpoint. And uh, it might be worth getting some input from field on with respect to your other parts of your question, sir? I, I, think, the, I think the fundamental problem is a, is a uh, problem at the national level. Um, the country is failing to graduate the numbers of scientists and engineers, particularly in physical sciences, uh, that it needs to sustain its level of economic competitiveness. It's been, there was an article in the paper just, uh, just this week um, about that. Um, at the graduate level, in you know, increasingly large fractions of uh, uh, PhDs are uh, foreign nationals. N not that they're not U.S. citizens. They are not. They are not U.S. citizens. Not that they're foreign born. They're not U.S. citizens. Uh, so far, uh, we have been able to uh, sustain our workforce. Um, uh, we have a program at at Livermore called the. Uh, Lawrence Fellows, which is a very prestigious um, postdoc program. Um, a large fraction of the very best PhDs that we see are foreign nationals. Um, and so it is a, again, it is widely recognized as a fundamental problem of the, of the country. We see the impact. Um, it's manageable to date, but I think it's something that is a, of a major consequence. Madam Chair, if I could just add one other Certainly. comment, please, that another concern I have uh, with the future of science is if you look at the trends uh, that we're already seeing uh, that uh, concern me uh, for the future. Uh, if we look at uh, NNSA um, as, uh, as we think of the budget, I think of it in three pieces. 
hands-on dealing with the stockpile, dealing with the infrastructure we've talked a lot about today, and the science uh, that underpins uh, all the judgment we have to make about confidence uh, in, uh, in our deterrent. Uh, as, as the stockpile ages and gets older, it takes more of our hands-on effort to take care, to take care of it and be confident about it. Uh, we've talked about the investment we need to make to recapitalize the complex. If we have a relatively flat budget, as you've, uh, this committee has indicated, uh, if those two elements are growing and have a flat budget, that means that the piece in the middle, the science, is going to get squeezed out. Uh, and that's a big concern of mine that, uh, that the workforce understands that, they feel that in a very visible way. And can we keep, uh, can we keep the workforce we have today and still recruit uh, the very best for the future? I'm very worried about that trend. Uh, and that uh, as we are sorting through uh, policy decisions on the direction, uh, like the commission you have in place, uh, I really urge, uh, I urge Congress to make sure that we do everything we can to uh, sustain uh, that level of science we can in the, in the interim so that we don't lose uh, this quality workforce we have today. Uh, before we go to Mr. Hun uh, Mr. Hunter, um, Mr. Redfield, yield for a second. Sure. Do you have a raw number of what the throughput of uh, engineers, for example, or uh, postdocs in physical sciences that, that the labs and the complex need uh, in the next five years, say, uh, what the throughput is, what number it is? Uh, and because I think the Congress and I think this subcommittee particularly would be very interested in working with our colleagues in, in other committees and certainly working with uh, um, the Secretary of Education to understand exactly what it is we need to do to galvanize uh, the forces necessary to begin to increase the numbers of Americans that are, uh, that are going through these classes and taking these courses. What, what I, I can give you just in, mm -hmm. we will take that because I think we want to give you a complete answer. Mm -hmm. um, I, an anecdote, if you will, there's 2,500 federal employees in the NNSA. Uh, we've done surveys and we've checked it with our employees. Who's retirement eligible? It's, it's, there's a difference between retirement eligible and actually retiring, as, mm -hmm. as we all recognize, and, 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 and as economic change, times change, that, that has an impact. But retirement eligible employees, uh, we have about 40 percent, 40 to 43 percent of our workforce, depending on what discipline they're in, whether they're engineers or business, are going to be retirement eligible. And a number of those have indicated that they will actually retire. In fact, that's why we've started our future leaders program, which will probably just hope to stem the tide, but it won't change the tide that the tide is going. So doing quick math, it's anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people out of 2,500. That's a pretty significant portion that we're, we're worried about. The average age of the workforce is, you know, it's about 49 years old or roughly or so, and we're driving that down with the younger folks, but, mm -hmm. but it's still a problem. Mr. Henry, you, I think I interrupted you, Mr. Everett, you still have time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to respond to both questions if I could. Uh, uh, first to the question of numbers, uh, we can always estimate anything as scientists and engineers, but roughly speaking, um, <laughs> Uh, roughly speaking, for our institution, if we look at our five-year plan, it's about uh, scientists and engineers roughly is about 300 per year. So you could argue maybe uh, similar to Tom's number, uh, 1,500 or so or to 2,000 people over the next five-year period would be expected to leave and then under a stable uh, picture, which we see, if there is a stable picture, then it would be replacements. Uh, back to the question, though, of the general availability. You ask how many uh, specifically uh, were uh, foreign nationals. In our case, very few. Uh, just in only very special cases of international science engagement or special fields outside the classified area do we have a few employees. Uh, we do allow them to be permanent employees under very special cases, but very few are actual an, an, uh, employees uh, that are not citizens. Uh, the other issue that, uh, adding on to what Dr. Miller said, was uh, not only is the nation not graduating enough uh, science engineers that are, that are, nat that are citizens, uh, we do not have an adequate representation, representation of both women and minorities in our gra uh, physical sciences graduate programs. And so we have to work, ver we work very hard in all those fields to try to, try to, to uh, seek out and find the best talent, uh, but the nation needs to do more. 
Uh, we have a lot of programs to do that. We're actively engaged on campuses all across the country, but it will be a challenge under any case on the best of conditions for any institution like these who would lead the country in the areas of physical sciences. Thank you. Um, Michael, I think I detected a subtle, not so subtle, plea for not a flat budget in your answers. But, uh, <laughs> uh, for uh, our two directors of uh, Los Alamos and Livermore, how will those labs continue to exercise their peer review functions as complex transformation, consolidation of missions, and function takes place? Um, I, I think this is a very important, uh, very important issue, um, particularly since the country is committed to no further nuclear testing. The best the government can get is the truly independent answers of, from Livermore and Los Alamos on any particular question. Uh, so I think it's very, uh, it's very important. It's something that Mike and I both spend a lot of time uh, looking at um, uh, through the annual. Um, assessment process. Uh, we do provide input to, uh, to each other. Uh, so the people at Livermore provide input to Mike on the things that Mike's responsible for. He provides input to me on things that I'm responsible for. Um, I personally believe that this process could be strengthened um, by uh, requiring that each laboratory do a complete analysis <laughs> of the entire stockpile every year. Uh, and so the this process can be strengthened. I think it's vitally important that it be strengthened. And the way we, do, again, the way we do the peer review is, is we work very hard at maintaining where it's important, um, independent capabilities in the computer simulations uh, that we do, uh, in many of the different kinds of experiments that we do to validate them. So we work very hard at making sure that we maintain that independence because it's so critical to us. Yeah, I just say I agree with what he said. Uh, and, and back to your comment to me, uh, uh, I think there's other ways to, to deal with the issue without increasing the budget, but it really relies on having a strategy, uh, a policy strategy for the country. Uh, once we have that, I think we can work with Congress and the administration to come up with an approach to uh, deal with the future. Uh, that you know, we can do with uh, reasonable cost, uh, but it really depends on what that policy direction looks like. And my plea was, until we have that, uh, let's hang in there and, and not do anything too detrimental to the science uh, until we get that sorted out. Well, we would uh, surely look forward to those uh, savings that, that uh, Director Sacasino said that are, are forthcoming. And, and uh, for our two directors um, that I addressed the question to, um, I won't take any further time here, but I would really appreciate a more specific detail on how you will continue to do that, uh, not the fact that you talk to each other and, and that sort of thing. But thank you very much. We'll be happy thank to you. If I could engage the ranking the member for a second. What I heard. Uh, Director D'Agostino say it was not necessarily more money, but more predictability. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. Thank you, Mr. Everett. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Franks of Arizona for five minutes. I'm not getting ahead of anyone here, am I, Madam Chair? Well, they've already asked Mr. Questions. Larson. Yeah, I already, we have a okay, all right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I guess I just first want to suggest that there's not too many nuclear physicists up here on the panel and there may be some things about tritium and uranium and plutonium that we still have to learn and uh, those of you in the R&D uh, field have uh, done some amazing things and I think that uh, the fact that uh, you're have been able to certify our, our weapons here for this long with the super supercomputer capabilities and the modeling that you've done is really nothing short of uh, astonishing in spite of some of the, the challenges that uh, you've laid out here um, related to getting new recruits into the system. And uh, of course, Mr. D'Agostino, uh, your efforts uh, to consolidate work and realize uh, efficiencies uh, as we uh, do this uh, transformation to a new 
complex. Uh, I, I, I gotta tell you, those are, those are pretty tall orders. So I've got two questions because I know some of you will um, a answer both of them. How can we on this panel uh, help you um, in your effort to maintain and gain uh, the necessary personnel to do the amazing work that you do? I mean, this is a, you guys are the, said many times, you're the, the hidden front line of freedom because a lot of times people don't see what you do, but it's a vital uh, to all of us. So how can we help you with that? And secondarily, uh, in terms of the efficiency or inefficiencies, uh, perhaps I should say, uh, in the old uh, complex uh, that uh, uh, we're trying to transform here, what are the, the, the most glaring inefficiencies that you would uh, postulate here and, and how can we best uh, facilitate or help uh, uh, you in the endeavor to correct some of those things? Okay. I'll, I'll start off, if I could, Mr. Franks, and, and open it up just a little bit. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, in fact, I think the subcommittee has, has started down the path by uh, helping drive to a national consensus. It's the stability that the lab directors had talked about is, is actually vitally important. Uh, the, uh, the workforce, uh, whether it's federal or contractor workforce, does pay close attention. They want to know that the nation values this work. They want to know, and, and because that's, that's their job. That's what motivates them. That's what drives them. So being uh, the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, of course, is, is essentially what we're really talking about here. You're in absolutely the right position to send the signal that, uh, that, that there is a consensus on what the nation should be doing in these areas and that there is a sense of stability because it does come down to being able to bring in the right kind of people. Well, we can have the best computers in the world, the best lasers in the world, uh, the best uh, um, experimental sites in the world, but ultimately in the end it comes down to getting those A-plus st students in here to operate those facilities. And, that's all based on stability because pe people make decisions that way, as you know, sir. Uh, and so the path forward that we have right now, uh, the evaluation of the uh, both secretaries had sent up a classified document describing our, uh, our security policy and strategy. We've got a, the bipartisan commission that's coming forward to take a look at strategic issues, kind of the melding of those two activities. And until we get a broader consensus that carries forward through both parties and, and spreads across, uh, making sure that the support to the existing infrastructure, which we consider fragile at this point, is maintained. And, um, and so I appreciate the committee's support in that area. Um, I would ask, are there any other comments? Okay. If I could uh, sure. comment uh, just very briefly, I think there are a couple areas that you've already begun nicely, uh, Congressman. That is to first uh, to recognize the important role, help us recognize the important role that the people and the institutions play in this in, in national security, and then wherever possible, encourage and enable an objective, fact-based national debate about what needs to happen in terms of policy, as this committee has done so well, and then in every um, possible avenue. Uh, encourage the the, uh, the role that we might play uh, in, in support of these broader national agenda themes such as the competitiveness of our scientists and engineers and the role we must play in broader national security. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I might just follow up then. Uh, in terms of the greatest uh, um, insufficient aspects or the areas that you think are our existing complexes, is falling short and, and uh, the areas that you hope to address in the transformational process uh, here. Sure. What do you consider to be your, your most significant challenges? And is there a time, and it's not a very fair, very fair question, uh, because I know your, your, your um, mission essentially is to provide a, a responsive infrastructure that will give the arsenal of freedom uh, safer, more secure, and more reliable uh, weapons. Uh, that said, is there a time that we're approaching in the country um, to where, with the existing uh, aging of the of the arsenal, that uh, you feel like certification is going to be a significant problem, um, or, and what can we do to head that uh, that off uh, in the days that we have now? Okay, uh, in the in the near term, I got got a list of typically half a dozen to a dozen items that I worry about 
all the time. Um, and it kind of depends on which is number one at the particular time. But they're basically the list is fairly uh, consistent. And I'll give you a couple of the things that worry me the most right now. And that is uh, a sustainable plutonium strategy. Uh, I don't think we, I know we're not on a, on a path that it provides sustainability. We have uh, a plan to uh, de-inventory Lawrence Livermore, which I think makes sense in the long run from a cost standpoint. And so we are starting to move plutonium out of Livermore. At the same time, uh, I don't have consensus um, in, I say, Congress broadly, if you will, I mean, from appropriations process, that uh, this replacement capability at Los Alamos will, will get built. So at some point, either myself or the person that follows me in this job will have to decide, uh, do we need to stop consolidating special nuclear material? Because we, don't, we can't get consensus to rebuild that plutonium capability at Los Alamos, and therefore I've got to go with my next best facility, and that's one at, in California. That goes against some other things about what's right for, from a safety and security standpoint. So plutonium infrastructure is one that kind of bubbles, to, is always in my top five at, at any given point in time. You're absolutely right on the continued aging of our stockpile. Uh, in an unclassified setting, I, could, I can say that we, uh, and the lab directors will comment on this specifically, but that, uh, you know, things do age, and we do have problems that come up every year, and right now we're able to address those. But there will, there may come a time that we don't know if we'll be able to address all of our problems. Uh, right now we can, and it's actually because of the support this committee has given over a number <coughs> of years that have allowed us to bring in the tools and the people to make sure we can do that. Um, Mike or George? Or I, I would just um, step back to a uh, earlier theme. My biggest concern is sustaining the investment in the science and technology infrastructure because that underpins everything. You know, the uh, people at these three laboratories provide the ability to make decisions about plutonium or uranium or facilities or the stockpile. Now, that intellectual capability is the fundamental basis. Uh, Mike and I have both over the last two years lost over 2,000 people. Each. 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 <laughs> A substantial number of those are people with uh, critical skills uh, that are relevant to uh, Under Secretary D'Agostino's mission. Um, uh, that infrastructure, as many infrastructures are, uh, is fragile. And so my, that is my biggest concern, is sustaining that infrastructure because it is the underpinning of the country's policy, whatever direction it chooses to go. Could, could I just add to that, Madam Chairman? Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with what George said completely, that the premise of stockpile stewardship in the absence of nuclear testing to minimize our need ever to go back was to have a more fundamental science-based understanding to guide our insights and judgments and uh, what I fear is the trend trend is to move away from that at the same time and this is the part I'd like to add is that if you look at the stockpile and we had a good classified discussion with this subcommittee uh, uh, some months ago and I think you got to see some of uh, the specifics but as time goes on as these weapon system age uh, as we go and act, uh, take action to uh, to deal with those issues as they come, we're moving further and further away. We're making small changes that are accumulating. Uh, even if we do life extension programs, as that progresses forward, I worry that the stockpile, uh, a legacy Cold War stockpile that we continue to try to refresh, uh, will be harder and harder for us. Will require more and more science to be able to have that confidence uh, when you have systems that, uh, that were designed uh, to be uh, low margin. Uh, and as our con uncertainty about the changes we're making starts to grow over time and accumulates, uh, I worry that, uh, that we should be increasing the science uh, focus uh, in that kind of a world. And yet the trend feels as if we'll be moving in the opposite direction. So it's the two things together, I think, that worry me the most. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you, Madam Chair. I think Tom just wanted to say something quickly. Just, and I'll be very brief. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I don't know if there's a time that's predictable, but I know there's an indicator of the time uh, when we've passed the point when we're, it's due, 
and that is when we have uh, leadership in the laboratories who do not have the intellectual and uh, an intuitive sense about what it takes to honestly assess and certify weapons. <coughs> they do not have the incentives or the value base to make factual objective opinions. Uh, I think Mr. Ray has uh, <coughs> one question to yes. close. Just uh, uh, on, on a couple of issues. Uh, the first one, uh, just to follow up on Dr. Hunter's uh, comment uh, in terms of uh, diversity and, and particularly uh, uh, in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, which is a, has been a priority for, for Congress. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Diversity Caucus that is working to uh, facilitate programs uh, and, and efforts to get more minorities into, into STEM. Uh, and I know, having had the opportunity to visit all the labs, uh, that you work with uh, historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. Um, are you doing, uh, and this is for the directors, are you doing uh, any more uh, in, by way of outreach uh, to the HBCs and HSIs uh, to increase that? And uh, secondly, uh, we, uh, we're probably gonna have some, some hearings, uh, the tri -caucus uh, group the Asian American, the Hispanic Caucus, and the Black Caucus together on how we can work on this issue, and we may ask uh, you to come and, and testify. So uh, we'll we'll be in touch. It probably won't be this year because of the election year, and but but we have that on the on the radar scope. The other the other question that I have is uh, deals with with energy and. Uh, whether we're talking about nuclear or getting g better gas, gas mileage or whatever, are our labs doing anything in that area? And if you would answer, uh, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Congressman. It's a very important question, but it gets back to this uh, comment that all of us made earlier about the labs having this inherent science and engineering foundation that can contribute in other areas of national security, of which energy is a dominant one, I think. Uh, yes, we're actively engaged in energy. Um, we anticipate more uh, programs in that area. Uh, we're working everything from the details of the combustion process and how to make cars more efficient and, and better environmentally compatible uh, to making engines work better, to using sunlight, uh, to helping nuclear energy be safe and secure and more proliferation resistant, a broad range of programs. Um, but uh, the, uh, it, it, these labs are uniquely positioned to contribute in many of those areas because of the skill base that's been developed in nuclear weapons and applied to those other areas. Yeah, I think the answer to both of your questions is yes. Uh, we uh, are uh, continuously expanding our interactions with um, the historically black colleges and Hispanic colleges. We bring uh, faculty to the labs for summer, exp for summer research. Um, and, and so we have a, a very broad set of problems, uh, pro projects and, and outreaches uh, to a wide segment of the university community. Uh, and as Tom said, we have very, very broad uh, programs in energy, again, using supercomputers to design more aerodynamically uh, efficient uh, trucks and cars all the way to uh, the use of the National Ignition Facility as a source of, uh, as a source of energy, uh, doing the research that would allow us to uh, meet that promise and essentially everything in between. So we have a lot of, today they're small programs because the government's investment is typically small. They were very large in the uh, 70s uh, when there was an energy crisis. Uh, and, but the fundamental point is the one that Tom made, which is the underlying science and technology is ideally suited to take on these uh, broader set of uh, uh, national issues. If I could add to, to those things, and then I would, I think uh, Steve Younger has uh, some comments as well. Um, on, uh, on your first question about the diversity, uh, yes, we uh, are very actively working with the uh, historically black and his Hispanic uh, uh, colleges. In northern New Mexico, we're all doing additional things uh, like our uh, math and science academies uh, as an example, uh, we're trying to to get to the students uh, when they're younger to try to try to encourage them to, to consider math and science and engineering as a field. Uh, 
Uh, and so for me, a key is to try to get the teachers uh, in the middle schools and uh, high schools who teach science and math. Uh, we have them come, uh, as an example, come to the lab and get engaged with our scientists and, and to, to try to get that passion and excitement about what modern science is like and help them come with uh, modules that they can use in the classroom to teach students uh, at whatever level they're teaching at. Uh, I think that's also a fruitful way. And, and again, in northern uh, New Mexico, we deal with a very diverse uh, population and trying to get them interested in these careers, uh, and a lot of scholarship programs, et cetera. Uh, back to the, uh, to the other question uh, about our participation. I agree with the, my colleagues on that. I would just add another thought, which is that I think these laboratories uh, are rather unique in the country. Uh, in another way, we have breadth and depth in science and engineering that's hard to find anywhere else. But we have one other thing, is we're institutions that span um, discovery, fundamental science, uh, all the way through applied science to building demo products that can be transferred uh, to industry. That full spectrum of activity goes on at these institutions and there now that we don't have a Bell Labs anymore and those kinds of places in industry these are some of the few places left in the country that have that kind of capability and so when you're thinking of these uh, ideas of uh, energy uh, or other uh, related kinds of things uh, not only do we have that breadth and depth of talent but we know how to take discovery uh, science and translate it all the way into a, a real product that American industry that could go use uh, for the advantage of the American people. Congressman, I created and continue to chair the Diversity Council about a test site. It's interesting that very early on we focused on education as the dominant concern of diversity. And we've taken a comprehensive approach, starting with elementary schools, uh, building science labs in local schools that never had them, particularly in impoverished areas. Uh, we bring high school interns into the company to show them what it's like uh, to have a technical job to interest them in going into a technical field. When they get to college, we provide a, a, a large scholarship program to the local community, also to the children of our employees. And we've also started an employee scholarship program uh, focused on minorities that will help them get the education that sometimes they haven't been able to get uh, because of their economic circumstances. Uh, we serve on advisory boards of black colleges and universities and those with large Hispanic uh, content. So we go everywhere from kindergarten through graduate school to encourage people to go into fields that are relevant to the national security missions we focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Conrad, I didn't mean to did not respond to your other question about that. I think your question was uh, uh, about minority engagement. I thought we'd close that topic, but let me just say, you, you ask a very important question. I would, my, my simple response would be uh, that we are, um, we are very aware of the situation nationally. We're very engaged in the national scene. We're doing a lot, but not enough, and we'd be happy to support your efforts in a broader committee framework. Under Secretary D'Agostino, thank you for your appearance today. And uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your appearance today. Please extend on behalf of the committee our thanks to the thousands of people, patriotic, hardworking Americans that work in the complex. Uh, our very best thanks. And uh, tell them to continue to their hard work, please. And behind you, many of you, uh, are your staff that, have, uh, that provide the committee and the members with uh, constant support while you're back at your facilities. We want to thank them very much. Uh, we know that they had a lot to do with uh, your appearances today and the, and the great testimony we had. Uh, we have a, a second panel that we're about to see, so thank you again very much, Under Secretary. We're going to take a strategic pause to uh, change out our folks. And uh, if we could ask the second panel to, um, to come forward, please. Thank, thank you, you very, Chair. very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Our thank pleasure. You.
would be uh, also happy to uh, 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 We are about to start our second panel. We, we thank this, the panel, uh, the second panel, for their indulgence. Um, we had, as you know, a, a uh, lot of people on the first panel, but we want to make sure that you understand how important we think you are, too. Uh, and uh, we very much thank you for coming to uh, testify before the committee. Um, I want to welcome our expert witnesses on the second panel. We have Mr. Uh, Gene Aloise, Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Division of the General Accountability Office. My constituent and friend, Mary Leah Kelly, Executive Director of Tri-Valley Cares, and Ambassador Paul Robinson, President Emeritus of the Sandia Corporation. Uh, as this panel demonstrates, the subcommittee is determined that our conversations about these critical national issues are inclusive and dynamic. Mr. Aloise, the floor is yours. Uh, we have your prepared statement, so we welcome any summary of your remarks that you might have. Thank you, Madam Chair. The floor Chair. is yours. Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the National Nuclear Security Administration's plans to transform the nation's nuclear weapons complex. Over the past decade, NNSA has invested billions of dollars sustaining the Cold War nuclear weapons stockpile and maintaining the aging and outdated facilities that make up the nuclear weapons production infrastructure. Modernizing the complex to be more responsive to a smaller nuclear deterrent offers NNSA the potential to save billions of dollars by consolidating special nuclear material into fewer facilities and avoiding operations and maintenance costs by vacating buildings that are well past their design life. Transforming the complex, however, will be a daunting and expensive task. Existing facilities that maintain the current stockpile must remain operational during the transition to new facilities. NNSA must also take steps to minimize the potential safety, security, and environmental impacts of relocating operations and constructing new infrastructure. In the face of these challenges, we believe that there are four actions that are critical to successfully transforming the weapons complex. First. DOD will need to establish clear long-term requirements that define the types and quantities of nuclear weapons needed in the stockpile. Second, after DOD establishes its requirements, NNSA will need to develop accurate estimates of the cost of transformation. Third, NNSA will need to develop and implement a transformation plan with measurable milestones. And fourth, NNSA's Office of Transformation must have the authority to enforce its decisions and be held accountable for them. With regard to clear requirements for the stockpile, in our view, before any plans for a new weapons complex can be finalized, DOD and NNSA must determine the number and types of warheads that are needed. While DOD and NNSA have considered a variety of scenarios for the future composition of the stockpile, including new warhead designs, 
A final decision on the size and composition of the future stockpile has not been made. With regard to cost estimates for transformation, our work shows that NNSA had difficulty developing realistic defensible cost estimates, especially for large complicated projects. For example, in March 2007, we reported that eight of the 12 major construction projects DOE and NNSA were managing had experienced cost increases ranging from almost $80 million to $8 billion. These increases resulted largely from poor management and con contractor oversight. Regarding a transformation plan, we do not yet know whether NNSA will decide to rebuild the complex at its existing sites or to consolidate operations at new locations. Regardless of its choice, however, NNSA will need to develop a plan with clear, specific, and realistic milestones that it can use to evaluate progress and that the Congress can use to hold NSA accountable. Finally, we have found that a key practice for successfully transforming an organization is to ensure that top leadership sets the direction, pace, and tone for the transformation. Although NNSA has organized an Office of Transformation to oversee its efforts, it remains to be seen whether the Office has sufficient authority to enforce its decisions. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, regardless of the approach chosen to modernize the weapons complex, any attempt to change such an extremely complicated <coughs> enterprise must be based on solid analysis, careful planning, and effective leadership. Tracking NNSA NNSA's progress in these four critical actions that we have identified provides a framework for the Congress to continue its vigilant oversight and to hold NSA accountable for its efforts. Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my statement. I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Alois. Um, before I give the floor to Mary Lee Kelly, I would like to commend you for your leadership on the issues before us today. Additionally, you've been a tireless advocate for the former Department of Energy workers who seek compensation from the government for the illnesses they contracted in the course of their service to the nation. You are frankly a force of nature. And at home in Livermore, uh, you are someone that I enjoy working with and I really appreciate you being here. It's been a pleasure to work with you on the environmental and quality of life issues uh, that you uh, bring to the fore constantly on behalf of my constituents. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and thank you to the subcommittee for inviting me here. Um, I'm Mary Leah Kelly. As mentioned, I'm Executive Director of the Livermore, California-based Tri-Valley Cares and have been since the group was founded in 1983. Um, I ask that my written testimony be entered into the record. That I'm going so to attempt to summarize an excerpt um, here today. Uh, my testimony will focus on three areas. First, the um, National Nuclear Security Administration's preferred alternative for complex transformation. Second, a stockpile management alternative that will better assure the safety and reliability of the existing nuclear weapons stockpile at lower cost, reduced scientific risk, and superior nonproliferation benefit. And third, some specific alternatives and recommendations for the future of nuclear materials and specific sites. The NNSA has stated that complex transformation is the agency's, quote, vision for a smaller, safer, more secure, and less expensive nuclear weapons complex, end quote. Beneath the rhetoric, Complex transformation calls for a significant revitalization of the nuclear weapons complex. The planned centerpieces include a new, larger plutonium complex at the Los Alamos lab in New Mexico and a new uranium processing facility at the Y-12 plant in Tennessee. According to the draft 2008 programmatic environmental impact statement, complex transformation is based, based, on the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review. Yet Congress has already mandated that the next administration prepare a new posture review. Thus, the NNSA's plan, when it's completed, will be dead on arrival, based on yesterday's policy, not forward-looking vision. The NNSA calls its complex transformation plan, quote, unquote, more secure. But as I'll discuss in the Livermore Lab section that follows, this plan keeps thousands of pounds of plutonium and highly enriched uranium in a vulnerable, untenable situation at Livermore Lab until 2012. Then NNSA proposes to move 
the plutonium twice in service of complex transformation. This is not a plan that appropriately prioritizes the security of nuclear materials. Finally, the NNSA insists that the plan will be less expensive. But as you heard in the previous round of questioning, um, they don't have a cost estimate. And in fact, the programmatic environmental impact statement does not contain a cost estimate. Independent cost estimates begin at about $150 billion and go up from there. The, NNN, the NNSA has said that the Reliable Replacement Warhead Program, or RRW, quote, will be the enabler for stockpile and infrastructure transformation. Since Congress has prudently cut the RRW budget since then, the NNSA has begun submerging the role of RRW in complex transformation. Make no mistake, however, the development of new and or significantly modified nuclear weapons remains at the heart of the complex transformation approach, whether through RRW or a successor design program. The plan and runs both the commission that this subcommittee was instrumental in enabling through the National Defense Authorization Act of 2008 and the aforementioned uh, new nuclear posture review coming up. The NNSA has received between 115,000 and 120,000 public comments, spoken comments, comment letters on the draft programmatic environmental impact statement for complex transformation. This outpouring of comment represents a public referendum against the preferred alternative. In sum, complex transformation is wrong policy enabling new nuclear weapons programs that run counter to U.S. nonproliferation aims, wrong direction, building unneeded nuclear weapons facilities, wrong priorities, costing $150 billion or more, and failing to quickly secure the nation's most vulnerable nuclear materials, and wrong timing, putting the cart of new bomb building capabilities before the horse of new policy and posture reviews. The public has roundly rejected this plan. Congress has cut funds for some of its aspects. And the NNSA tells me it will release the final PEIS and execute a record of decision this fall. That's also what you heard from Administrator D'Agostino. In so doing, the NNSA willfully ignores an alternative approach to managing the nuclear weapons stockpile that's technically, politically, environmentally, and fiscally superior to the agency's preferred alternative. So let me say a few words about curatorship. Curatorship focuses, it is an alternative, it focuses on careful surveillance, analysis, and refurbishment of the actual weapons in the arsenal, rather than pushing the envelope on new research and development, as is the case with the present stockpile stewardship program and to an even greater extent the proposed RRW path. Under curatorship, only if NNSA surveillance activities demonstrate compelling evidence that a component had degraded or would soon degrade, and further analysis indicated that such degradation would cause significant loss of safety or reliability, would NNSA replace that affected part. The replacement would be remanufactured as closely as possible to the original design. So changes to weapons would be minimized using the curatorship approach. One significant outcome of curatorship is that less uncertainty would be introduced into the stockpile over time than is the case with the present RRW program, I'm sorry, the present stockpile stewardship program or with RRW. And you heard, uh, Los Alamos Lab Director Mike Anastasio say that he's worried that the incremental changes that are introduced into the weapons with stockpile stewardship over time may cause certification problems. Curatorship would minimize this by minimizing the changes. The curatorship will reduce the NNSA's environmental footprint and its operating costs. Under curatorship, NNSA would close numerous facilities that use high explosives, tritium, and other hazardous materials beyond what's in the complex transformation preferred alternatives. Curatorship would rein in costs. Right now, if you look 
uh, at the annual budget, the NNSA spends about 50% of the weapons activities budget each year on R&D. Under curatorship, that would drop to about 20%. The curatorship approach to managing the nuclear weapons stockpile builds on an impressive lineage that I want this subcommittee to understand. It stands on basic concepts advocated by Norris Bradbury, who was the Los Alamos lab director from 1945 to 1970, Carson Mark, the former head of Los Alamos lab's theoretical division, Richard Garwin, former nuclear weapons designer and current Jason, an occasional testifier before this and other committees, Ray Kidder, senior staff scientist and former weapons designer at Livermore Lab and others. In recent years, the curatorship approach has been further developed by Dr. Robert Siviak, who some of you know because he was with the Office of Management and Budget until 1999. And it's also been evaluated recently by Livermore Lab staff, including Dr. Roger Logan, who served as head of the lab's directed stockpile work until recently. Um, I would further ask that Tri-Valley Care's much more detailed 42-page comment on curatorship and complex transformation uh, be entered into the record. That objection so ordered. Thank you. Um, I would like to quickly um, end with a sample of alternative approaches and recommendations for specific um, sites. And first, Livermore Lab. Um, as Madam Chairwoman knows, but maybe the rest of you uh, don't know my community as well. The main site at Livermore sits on little more than one square mile with homes and apartments, including my home, built right up to the fence line. Suburban neighborhoods lie only about 800 yards from the lab's super block and thousands of pounds of plutonium and highly enriched uranium. Tri-Valley Cares has long held concerns regarding the safety and security of nuclear materials at Livermore Lab. This spring, the Department of Energy undertook a series of security drills at Livermore Lab, including a force-on-force -force test, in which a tactical security team played the role of an attacking force in order to see how the lab's uh, security uh, would respond. The mock terrorist team's objective was to get to the nuclear material and hold the ground long enough to construct an improvised nuclear device. A second scenario involved the would-be attackers stealing plutonium for use at a later date. While NNSA has yet to respond to Tri-Valley Care's Freedom of Information Act request for unclassified records regarding that security drill, the information we've gathered from multiple sources so far is that the mock terrorists succeeded in both of those objectives. Remember, you've got 10,000 people on one square mile, that's the Livermore Lab workforce and subcontractors, 1,000 or so people across the street at Sandia and thousands of us in the community right up to the fence line. Imagine what that means. Tri-Valley Cares concludes that the plutonium and highly enriched uranium at Livermore Lab is not secure, nor can it be made secure due to the compactness of the site it's 600 buildings that are cheek to jowl and the close proximity of the densely populated neighborhoods. We oppose the NNSA proposal to leave these materials at Livermore Lab through 2012 as outlined in the draft complex transformation to EIS. Our colleagues at POGO have uh, released a report that suggests they should get it out by and can get it out by 2009. Our research shows uh, early 2010 at the earliest in terms of safe packaging and removing that material. In addition to removing special nuclear material from the lab, any forward-looking plan for the future of the complex would conclude that there's no need to maintain two full-service nuclear weapons design labs. It's entirely feasible to transition Livermore Lab to new missions. This is the path in my organization's view and in my own, and based on the numerous conversations I've had with Livermore Lab folks. This is the true path to jobs and job security, is diversifying and changing the mission. Nonproliferation, research on global climate change, non-polluting renewable energy technologies, and other science in the national interest would replace weapons R&D at Livermore. Livermore would maintain a small weapons footprint with about a two dozen um, select staff supporting curatorship, about the same number, about two dozen, 
uh, providing that peer review that was discussed in the first panel on certification and doing certification pass. The security cost would plummet. This is very necessary in making Livermore Lab competitive and attracting research projects. My understanding is for every $100,000 FTE right now, it costs about four hundred dollars to $450,000. We need to reduce the security print footprint in order to make Livermore Lab a competitive place to do other science in the national interest. And I am convinced that that can be done. Next, very quickly, Los Alamos Lab, Tri-Valley Cares opposes complex transformations proposal to expand plutonium pit production at Los Alamos Lab from the current 20 pits per year to up to 80 plutonium bomb cores per year. And in this regard, we note that the proposed CMRR nuclear facility portion should not be built. If the nation is doing curatorship for a declining arsenal, no additional capability is needed. So likewise, at Y12, the uranium processing facility should not be built. Want to conclude? You're, you're, you're really over time, so if you can conclude soon. Okay, I will conclude with a, a couple of sentences from my paragraph on the Kansas City plant. Here, the NNSA is poised to privatize a key part of the nuclear weapons complex, which will circumvent the ability of Congress to authorize this committee's ability to authorize, and also Congress's ability to appropriate funds. The plan is to build and operate a new Kansas City plant under a leaseback arrangement. Alternatives were given short shrift. NNSA and the General Services Administration have undertaken activities that do appear to support a predetermined outcome, which is a violation of law. Um, it also appears that they've uh, violated the OMB anti-deficiency guidelines, and we ask that Congress ask the GAO to investigate the lease arrangement and agency action. Thank, thank you, you very much. Ambassador Robinson, President Emeritus of the Sandia Laboratories, thank you so much for being with us again. Uh, you've appeared before the subcommittee many times. Uh, your service to the American people is significant and very much appreciated. Uh, we would, uh, your statement has been submitted for the record and we would appreciate um, your summation of your statement since we are about to have votes in about 15 minutes and we want to be able to get to questions. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, let me just highlight then a couple of issues. Uh, I think we're all three here in, in agreement on one point, and that is the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review does not provide good guidance to move ahead with the uh, complex reconfiguration. Uh, uh, there's some fundamental flaws, I think, in what was done, a mixing of conventional forces and nuclear forces, which really don't mix well, mm -hmm. uh, was made and it sort of froze our planners in place, worrying about how do we do that. Uh, nuclear weapons and our deterrent force is something to prevent war, not to fight wars. And uh, this confusion of a global strike uh, needs to be reconsidered and get us back on the right course of preventing wars as, as the main reason for this complex. Uh, the time since I've retired, I've uh, served on a number of government uh, panels, uh, including more in the DOD. I'm currently serving on the Nuclear Command Control Comprehensive Review I served on the Nuclear Capabilities Study, uh, which uh, Johnny Foster and uh, General Welch chaired, and uh, we had a lot to say uh, then about problems both in DOD and DOE, but more in their integration or lack thereof uh, that I believe is a very, very serious issue uh, for, for us to draw this complex uh, together. It's always been a problem. Uh, it's been good at times, then it wanders apart, but we're in a particularly uh, a bad disconnect uh, between the agencies at the moment. Uh, I did want to say to this committee, I was present, I believe, at the birth of the concept of RRW. Uh, and General Welch, uh, who is the chairman of the Strategic Advisory Group for the Commander Strategic Command, uh, had challenged the lab directors at a meeting and said, look, we're in an interim state where we're all trying to see if we can develop stockpile stewardship so we would not have to test weapons, but there's no proof yet that that's going to work. 
And there is a safeguard on the table that says, if we go into a future president and say, Mr. President, we've got a serious problem with the stockpile, uh, we've had to take systems off alert, uh, we believe we're going to have to test to fix whatever problems uh, have been discovered. He said, will every president in the future have to exist that you might be coming in next week with such a conversation? And the, the challenge he then gave was, what could you be doing now that could lessen that likelihood? And that really began uh, the thinking process to give birth to what is the reliable replacement warhead concept. Uh, I was disappointed that there were discussions in the Congress saying, well, these people may be trying to do something to force uh, nuclear testing. I assure you it was quite the opposite motivation. It's what can we do to forestall the date. And I believe the, the approach is a reasonable one, genetic diversity, so that nothing in one leg of the stockpile is likely to fail, you, that you would have to uh, go in and uh, request uh, permission uh, for nuclear tests. It's a very good strategy and one worthwhile uh, for our nation to be pursuing in these circumstances uh, uh, in which we're in today. Uh, the question of the preferred alternative, I uh, said in my testimony, I have mixed reaction. They've done some good things. It's certainly much improved over the plan of the Complex 2030 but still without specific guidance that only the Defense Department can prepare in details what stockpile is it we're going to work with, and then lastly place an emphasis on fixing problems that are going to arise in the stockpile, whatever we do, whether it's life extension, whether it's uh, reliable replacement uh, warheads. These are the oldest components in our history of nuclear weapons. The very oldest today and they're only going to continue to age. Uh, so what can we do uh, to prepare ourselves in the best position? <coughs> Our deterrent does remain the best insurance policy for this nation against a major war and I'm concerned we've got to preserve it for the future. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm going to reserve my time uh, and Mr. Larson, who has not had a chance to ask some questions, and I'll yield him five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it's uh, Aloise. Aloise, yes. Aloise. Mr. Aloise, um, your fourth point in the GAO study regarding successful transformation requires a strong office of transformation. Did you make a determination about whether NSA needs an office of, of transformation at all uh, in order to implement any of these changes? Uh, well, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, w our thinking is we believe it does, but our recommendation was it report directly to the administrator. Right now it reports to the Office of Defense. Uh, Office of? Oh. Defense Programs. Okay. DP. DP. And um, our thinking was it would have to have the authority and the support of the organization to be worthwhile. Uh, the authority to make decisions and the authority and the responsibility to be accountable for those decisions. And the, the office itself? Yes. And it currently does not? Uh, it remains to be seen. Can you explain that? Well, it doesn't report directly to the administrator, so once it starts making decisions, we'll have to take a look at that. Okay. Uh, and it does seem uh, a difficult difficult thing that, uh, so long as, as uh, uh, policymakers and us in Congress and the administration Presumably, the future administration, we haven't set long-term requirements for the weapon stockpile, and so I understand the debate we're having here about uh, um, either going the wrong way, as uh, Ms. Kelly has suggested, or getting it half right, perhaps, as Ambassador Robinson has suggested, um, until we decide what we want for a stockpile. Um, it makes it difficult. But Ms. Ms. Kelly, um, I didn't gather from your testimony though, what specific comments you had with regards to the sprawling complex that we have now. Um, you just said, uh, well, I, I don't want to characterize it as all negative, but 
um, it sounded to me like your your views and your group's views on um, uh, on where they're headed is was all negative, but n none of the issues you brought up had to do with the issue that part of the issue we have is consolidating facilities mm -hmm. so that we're not spending money on things we're not mm -hmm. using or could be mm -hmm. best mm -hmm. uh, uh, money could be better spent if we had things closer together. Mm -hmm. Can you address that issue? Um, certainly. Um, one of the things I was trying to get across and it was difficult with excerpting is that if the nation were to go to a strategy that was closer to curatorship, um, that you could have actually much more consolidation than you have with the preferred alternative under complex transformation. Um, the preferred alternative under complex transformation has significant numbers of, of new facilities, and I talked specifically right. about the CMRR nuclear facility portion in particular, and um, the uranium processing facility. Uh, so my group challenges the idea that you actually need to build these new facilities with all kinds of flexibility, which you heard in, in the first um, panel, um, but too expensive. And if you're curating the existing arsenal and you're going down in the arsenal numbers, they're not needed. Um, we, we certainly do not um, propose leaving the entire complex as it now exists in place. So there's a certain starting point um, agreement that we have with, uh, uh, with say, Tom D'Agostino. Um, but in the name of consolidating, they're moving from eight NNSA sites to eight NNSA sites once this is fully implemented. You still have eight sites. You have plutonium at a, at a couple less sites. You have new facilities. So we're suggesting it's not really the consolidation that the country needs. We need a much more. Well, I guess I'd also say that moving from eight sites to eight sites doesn't mean that there hasn't been consolidation. That is probably not a fair assessment of consolidation. If there are eight smaller sites or five smaller sites within that eight, and and the and the facilities on those sites are smaller as well, it seems to be moving towards consolidation. I'd be careful about comparing eight to eight. And we think that, that you could get more consolidation and, for example, the Livermore mission could, um, could change. Change outright. Could change outright. Yeah. Although we would retain that peer review. We would retain a curatorship yeah. force of a couple dozen specialists with, with and the, also a sorry. certification force. With the short time I have left, Ambassador sure. Robinson, can you give me some perspective that you have on consolidation and, and the cur curatorship idea? Well, um, the program that was started in the early 90s with the, the proposal to go under a, a test ban mor moratorium, right. uh, science was at its core. It was science-based stockpile stewardship. There are a number of things that are empirical in nuclear weapons. We do not have uh, adequate explanation to be able to depend upon uh, large supercomputers and modeling codes and everyone dedicated themselves to trying to develop that science understanding. The curatorship approach would throw that out and say, well, we just won't worry about whether we understand it or not. We'll just try the best we can do to not make any changes and hope for the best. I don't think that's the right approach. I think uh, that's not likely to lead to a suitable uh, outcome and make it more likely that we would have doubts in our uh, strategic deterrent force and more likely that we would be requesting the ability to test to prove out the force. Uh, just quickly, Mr. Aloise, in conclusion, ha have you looked at, uh, uh, did, did, were you responsible at all for looking at any of the alternatives that, that uh, NNSA looked at as a prepared their um, their impact statement? Uh, no, sir, we didn't. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. Everett. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Robertson, the uh, military has a, uh, in the world that we live in, in the future with, with uh, almost every country we know getting involved in uh, nuclear weapons and with uh, many of our uh, allies such as uh, Britain, France, uh, uh, others like China, um, the military continues to need a, uh, have a requirement for a more responsive infrastructure 
with more reliable, safe, and secure weapons, I believe. Let me ask you, uh, if we would like to do something about bringing down the stockpile even further, we've done a good job in the Moscow Treaty. And if we would like to get to the hedge uh, weapon, uh, would it not make sense that we, in, uh, I don't want to put words in your mind, uh, I'm asking you the question, would it make sense for us to continue down the path of RRW that does absolutely does not increase yield or anything like, like that, it guarantees a safe weapon? Would the military, they don't want to give up those hedge weapons right now, I can understand why, but if they had something like RRW, would this not be a way to further reduce the stockpile of hedge weapons? I believe that was our intent uh, from the first, yes, sir. Uh, I should have probably added, I have the bitter experience when I headed uh, the nuclear weapons program at Los Alamos early in my career, uh, I had to make such a call to the commander of then Strategic Air Command to take a certain class of weapons off alert and targeting because of a serious problem that had been uncovered. I remember every second of that day and relive it, would not like to relive it again. Uh, we need some alternatives that we can have confidence that we're not betting our country uh, on a system we can't be sure of. Uh, I believe uh, having a variety of designs will instill confidence to make sure we aren't taking a, a full uh, deterrent force uh, off alert. Uh, I do have problems about the, the strategy besides the 2001 uh, nuclear posture review. The weapons we developed were for a different time and place. The yields of most of our weapons are so high today that we're self-deterred from even considering their use. And so some of the things you can do with a uh, RRW program, and we've done it with the uh, existing weapon force in the, the past with secondaries, is go to lower yields, more appropriate uh, to deter uh, some of the rogue states which are now becoming nuclear. Uh, I think the Cold War stockpile is uh, incredible uh, to consider as a deterrent force for that. Uh, but we can do that without having to do nuclear tests. You can go lower in yield, you just can't go higher. Um, finally, just a comment. Uh, I do worry about the rogue states. I also worry about the non-active uh, non non-active states, uh, uh, terrorists. Especially when we get to a point where we get launch vehicles such as one SpaceX is working on that um, for seven to ten million dollars, and which can reach Leo low orbit uh, with a nuclear a weapon and destroy uh, basically an awful lot that this the United States in particular depends on more than any other country, both not our not only our military but our economy also. Uh, I do worry about the uh, that as well as rogue, uh, rogue state, and I'll have some questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Everett. Uh, Mr. Aloise, um, thank you for your great work. We really appreciate it. Um, if one assumes a relatively flat budget line for the NNSA weapons activities, um, are the NSA's complex transformation plans affordable and executable? Well, if you look at the preferred alternative, it, we look at that basically as modernization in place. Right. And um, the first thing they're going to have to do is get their stockpile requirements. They're going to have to know, NNSA has to know what it needs to right size to mm -hmm. before it does anything. Mm -hmm. While it's doing that, it has to maintain the current complex. And if there are cost increases and schedule delays in the life extension program like there has been in the past, that's going to affect funding in the future. And there are red flags already with the CMRR and the UPF. Two years ago when I testified on the subject, it was the CMR estimate was $840 million. Today it's $2 billion. We don't have any confidence in those estimates. Mm -hmm. The UPF range is from $1.4 billion to $3.5 billion. We don't have any confidence in those estimates. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the NNSA has to come up with good, supportable, verifiable cost estimates based on a, uh, stockpile numbers. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Ambassador Robinson, um, in your statement, you state that the primary purpose for nuclear weapons must be for deterring conflicts while the purpose of conventional forces is fighting. I agree with that. If the mission of the nuclear weapons is limited to deterrence, and I agree with it, do you see opportunities to reduce the number of deployed weapons below the level specified by the Moscow Treaty? Uh, and, and do you have any idea of what those constraints might be? Uh, the Moscow Treaty only limits a particular class of weapons, and there was an, a new counting rule put in uh, to uh, place uh, that were strategically uh, deployed uh, systems, so systems that are not on alert in the full class of tactical nuclear weapons, which are very, very large, uh, very large. in Russia, uh, are not covered. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to look at the whole counting scheme uh, in your question, and we have not done that yet. I agree with you. Uh, Ms. Kelly, um, in your testimony, uh, you stated, and I quote, under curatorship, only if the NNSA surveillance activities demonstrated compelling evidence that a component had degraded or could soon degrade, and further analysis indicated that such degradation could cause a significant loss of safety or reliability, would NSA replace the affected part? The replacement were re would be remanufactured as close to the original design as possible. That sounds like li that, that sounds like the life extension program to me. What if you if you don't think it is the life extension program? What do you think curatorship is, and why isn't it the life extension program? Um, we believe that curatorship is the life extension program as it should be, not as it presently is. Tell me the difference. And I, uh, uh, yes. And I want to um, uh, start by showing, and I realize it's pretty difficult from here, a view graph. Uh, this is from the Sandia Stockpile Life Study. Um, this, the curatorship really depends at its heart on a really good program. You said, what, 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 what do I like? A really good program that's headquartered at Sandia Albuquerque that Livermore, Los Alamos, and um, Pantax also participate mm -hmm. in the um, DOE Surveillance and Evaluation Program, or now NNSA Surveillance and Evaluation mm -hmm. Program. And this is 30 years worth of actual experience with U.S. nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in the stockpile. And it shows, without a doubt, that the most problems, and they're called actionable defects, mm -hmm. the lingo, uh, which are the ones that could impact safety or reliability, and so you do go out and fix them that you get between 61 and 29 of them the first three years. So anytime you make a significant change or put a new design in the arsenal, you have to fix a lot of things because mostly these are design flaws or production flaws and not sort of aging flaws. And then as the arsenal ages, you're talking about one to seven, one to nine uh, per year. And you notice after 30 years, it's not a bathtub curve, curve going back up. So that curatorship would really depend much more heavily than the stockpile stewardship program does. It includes it, but doesn't really depend on it heavily. This surveillance and evaluation program, and it would do the actionable defects. It would I still don't understand. Okay. So the only um, time a weapon is mo is is t tinkered with, so to speak, mm -hmm. is when there is something wrong with it. And so if there's only, if so you're effectively changing the name. You're saying your program is called curatorship. We're saying, got that, it's called lifetime, life extension programs. Okay, and. But I can't understand, I don't understand what, uh, it seems to me you're suggesting that life extension, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems that you're suggesting that life extension does more than what you're characterizing curatorship does. And what I'm telling you is, you're, your curatorship is life extension. Um, Administrator D'Agostino sort of briefly in his answer um, in the first panel said that there are times when uh, new parts are put into a warhead um, because we're taking advantage of, um, uh, of advances in certain kinds of technologies. What and he said was, and he, and he because we don't make vacuum tubes anymore, yeah. because um, 
we don't, yeah. you know. You and, un and under curatorship, you would, you would sort of hew to the design, the original design more closely. For example, in the unclassified literature for the LEP, for the W76. So you're suggesting you would keep vacuum tubes in, in a weapon system? Or you would do something that would that would hew more closely to the original design, for example, in the unclassified no, literature? No, answer, answer this question. Yeah. Vacuum tubes unavailable. What do you, and so you're going to take them out. And so you're going to look at that and you're either going to do vacuum tubes or something more like it. Can't get vacuum tubes. In the W76, um, the unclassified literature suggests that they're changing the height of burst. So he said it doesn't, that they're not changing the yield. And that may be, but there are significant changes that are. But that is not a performance criteria. That does not change the performance of the weapon. All it does, it, it, it's, it's something that's an effect of having to put new machinery in because what is in there is obsolete, not available, not reliable, can't find it, you know, whatever. And what I'm trying to say and, and mm -hmm. is that in the name of doing that, mm -hmm. there are changes that do not need to be made to weapon systems as they go through the life extension program. But and, I think that that's, that a, that's curatorship a, would, would. But that's a mistake. To assert that there are things being done to these weapons uh, that are not responsive to some uh, obsolescence of a part, some degradation of a part, some question of its performance, I think is wrong because that is not what life, life extension programs do. And keeping in mind that the fences around life extension are pretty enormous. No change to the mission, no change to the platform, no change to the yield, no change to the constitution of the weapon, i.e. no change of performance. So life extension can't be, can, cannot be asserted by anybody to be a program that enhances the performance of the weapon. That is not what it does. It enhances the reliability of the weapon. I think that it's, uh, uh, if you think that changing the height of burst of a weapon isn't changing its performance, that that's, you know, it's, it's difficult to talk about these issues, but well, that's Let me ask debatable. Dr. Robinson, hypothetically. Height of burst is something the military controls, and uh, it's completely within their control at all times and always was. So it's not an inherent uh, part of the weapon. And we haven't changed uh, the, the height of birth spectrum. Uh, it was all available. It's still available today. Uh, as I listen to this conversation, one of the things that I think could help enrich it is the fact that uh, a modern U.S. weapon, nuclear weapon, has about the same number of parts as a new Toyota, about 3,800, 3,800 parts. I can't give you the exact number here, but it's something under 50 parts are with the nuclear system itself, the so-called physics package, and the rest are all Sandia responsibilities for the, the maintenance, the uh, non-nuclear package, the arming, fusing, firing, and an enormous Radar. plethora of safety uh, devices to make sure they never go off uh, mm -hmm. uh, in an accident. Uh, we do test all of those other parts than the nuclear parts. And that's why most of the actions are taken is when we see a problem, we do indeed fix it. And that's the bulk of the work that goes on uh, in life extension. But life extension inherently is not performance enhancement. Correct. It is reliability assurance. And safety assurance, yes. Right. Okay. And that's, I, think, I think that's an issue where we should, we should try to find congruence. Um, you know, I, I, I think that what you're proposing as curatorship is life extension, and I think that if we could agree on that, then there are lots of other things where we could work, um, certainly on removing plutonium and things where this subcommittee has worked significantly to accelerate, to add money, to make demands, mm -hmm. to move the plutonium, mm -hmm. for example, out of Livermore. Um, we could work significantly on that, but I think, um, I don't think it's, uh, productive for us to take life extension, which is the most enormously successful program that we've had to maintain the deterrence of our nuclear weapons, which is still part of uh, the military requirement of this country, 
as of now and probably into the not too distant future and, and quibble around the edges of it when I think that there's a lot of work that really, that really needs um, your energy and your attention. Well, um, part of the difference in the two approaches is, the, it's, is that the science-based stockpile stewardship approach places such a premium on um, pushing the envelope of nuclear weapons science and curatorship. I mean, we actually said, well, what does the weapon need? We understand what the weapon scientists want. What does the weapon need? And it try, it's a program that tries to look at that issue uh, and so that you get a program that is based more on the, uh, the test data, more on modeling that has to do with uh, conformance to the test data. Uh, it's much more focused on the weapons it themselves. And that distinction, when you play it out in terms of, of, of what kind of, of new facilities or modernized facilities, um, has an impact. So we're not trying to come up with a program that has a different moniker for the same thing. We're, we're really trying to look more narrowly at what the weapon needs to maintain the existing safety and reliability to maintain it as close as possible to the warhead that was fully tested in Nevada mm -hmm. as a method for ensuring that we don't return to um, nuclear testing. So you don't walk the weapons away and also walk the codes away and potentially get into a situation some years down the road where they're a bit bollocked up. Well, I, I, would, I would join with my comment, the, the comments of my uh, esteemed and distinguished ranking member. Um, that he was teasing out of uh, Ambassador Robinson. I think, I think that you have to take this to its natural conclusion. Um, when we have this military requirement, when we have the uh, moratorium, which I, I certainly support, I would be supportive of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty being ratified. Right. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but while we have these weapons, um, and while we're taking them down, or I think we're doing a lot of good work in dismantling them, um, we, we have issues about uh, tactical and, and what, what are we going to do with the Moscow Treaty. While we have this military requirement um, and, and when we have this deterrent strategy, which I support, you have to have weapons that the military is going to believe are going to do their mission. If you're not going to have a science-based program that extends their life um, while, while at the same time not enhancing performance but does what we believe stockpile stewardship does, what concerns me is that what you're proposing looks more like a hospice program than it does keeping their life going. And what worries me is that you're going to find that you're going to have a military that stands up and says, you better test. And that's not where we want to go. And so and there's a I'm sweet spot. There's a sweet spot here that, that I think we're trying to find. And once again, I encourage, uh, I encourage your work. Uh, I encourage um, you to con consider you know, pushing the envelope. But I think that um, I'm not sure it's as productive as some of the other things that you've done to quibble about curatorship versus life extension when life extension is the gold standard. Uh, right now, we, we are concerned about in the next generation that we're going to be able to maintain without testing. But uh, it's worked for a very long time. It, it is, I think, where most people want to be uh, until we make a decision we don't need weapons. We're not going to unilaterally disarm in a multilateral world where weapons are proliferating, but I think um, I think that this is once again a very important conversation. We've got votes. I apologize that we're going to have to close the hearing. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for your service. Thank, thank you. you very much I'm for your testimony. I'm honored that you invited me, and thank you of very course, much. Of course, of course. Thank you. Hearing's adjourned.